great. I think we should probably go ahead and get started here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the STEG thematic workshop on, um, it has the complicated name of the thematic workshop on agriculture, sectoral and spatial frictions and trade. This is covering two of the six themes of the STEG program. I'm Doug Gollin and with Joe Kaboski, I'm one of the academic leads for the STEG program. Um, and the organizers for this conference are Kevin Donovan and Julieta Caunedo, uh, Paula Bustos and Costas Arkalakis. And on behalf of that whole group, I'd like to welcome you all to today's workshop. For those of you who aren't familiar with STEG, it's an acronym standing for Structural Transformation and Economic Growth. The STEG program is a program of academic research funded by the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and as part of the UK aid effort. STEG aims to support high quality academic research to inform policy and practice in low and middle income countries. And today's workshop is one of a, a set that we've been running through this month. As you can see on the STEG website, we've had a number of these already and there's a couple more ahead. Um, and these are really an opportunity to highlight some of the frontier work going on in macro development um, these days. We, we had some fantastic submissions to the conference calls this year, and we've only been able to showcase a subset of the papers that we found interesting. But my, my thanks to the theme leaders and others who helped to screen submissions and select papers. Um, this is a very much a team effort. I think the one other thing I'd like to note is that the work we're featuring in all of the thematic workshops this year has not actually been funded by STEG. We are in our first year, we've really just given out our first set of small grant awards over the summer, and that research has not yet come to fruition. We have a number of, um, we have a number of calls that are We've had a number of calls, one that just closed. We have a couple of others that will be opening up through the rest of the year. So please, if you're working in this area and interested in funding opportunities, please do check the funding page on the STEG website and have a look. We welcome submissions. We're looking to build and strengthen and broaden the community of researchers working in this area. And so to that end, these workshops this month are really designed to bring together a group of people who are thinking about growth and development at macro scales. And so I'm not gonna say much more at the moment. I think I'll just, um, people didn't tune in to hear a lot of introductory remarks, but so let me just turn things over without further ado to Laura Alfaro, who's gonna be chairing this initial session. So Laura, over to you. Thank you uh, very much and welcome to this uh, great session. The name is Capital and Development. The first paper is Structural Change, Inequality and Capital by Florian Trouvan. Each author has 30 minutes and then we'll open up for 10 minutes uh, Q&A. Uh, Florian? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, can you hear me all right? I think you'd yes. have to make me co-host so that I'm able to share my screen. Something like that. Yeah, Terrific. I, I don't... let me try again. Okay, great. Terrific, it's working out. All right, fantastic. Can you see my uh, set of slides? Should say structural change and equality in a capital puzzle. Yes. Fantastic. All right, so great. Thanks so much for including me in the program. I'm Florian. I'm a PhD student at the University of Michigan, and I've been uh, one of the people that have thoroughly enjoyed last year's lecture series. So I saw every single one of them, and I want to thank you very much. And now here presenting some early stage work is absolutely mind blowing for me. Um, this is, I've been working on this for a while, but it feels like early stage work still, and I'd be so appreciative of any uh, thoughts, comments, ideas, um, and, and there's my email, and please do feel free to reach out. So the title is Structural Change Inequality in the Capital Flow Puzzle. And the motivation is a longstanding question in the field of international macro, which is why doesn't capital flow from rich to poor countries? And so actually things are even worse when you look at fast growing emerging markets, the theory suggests that there should be um, strong capital inflows. And the intuition for the theory that is based on mostly neoclassical economics is that when I tell you today that in 10 years from now, you're gonna be twice as rich, then there's really only one thing that a forward looking representative agent should be doing, which is to smooth consumption. And that's the most powerful force in those types of models. And that usually in the model is strong capital inflows. 
Um, now, when you look at the data, of course, most of you already know this is not what the world looks like. So on, on, on the left panel, I'm showing you um, a plot where I plot average productivity growth of a country, of a developing economy, against average capital inflows. And so that plot is really a version of the Gruncher's and John um, paper in the Restart in 2013. And what you see is this negative link. So it looks like the, the, the fastest growing economies actually display capital outflows. And so that's quite puzzling. Now, when you look at the right panel, and this is the whole um, tech that I take today that's try to, to revisit this puzzle, you'll see that this correlation is actually completely driven by countries that display very fast range out of agriculture. Now, that's not too surprising for people here in the stake program because you know that growth and structural change go hand in hand, but it's going to allow us to ask whether urban rural differences potentially meaningfully relate to this longstanding puzzle. And so that's what, I, what I'm going to do today. So let me preview um, today's talk. So I'm, I'm going to study uh, structural change, urban rural differences, and how and the interplay of that. And I'm focusing on a growth miracle. And the growth miracle here is important because this puzzle emerges once I give you catch up growth, once I make you rich in the future, that's precisely when the neoclassical agent wants to smooth consumption. And that's where you get the counterfactual um, capital flows. So the first thing that I do today is I'm going to show you one empirical exercise that I also do in the paper, there's many more, where I try to convince you that there's systematically different saving behavior between urban and rural households. Um, if to the extent that this isn't purely an artifact of selection, you can start trying to see if that can help you understand um, the ramp up in savings and capital outflows along the transition path of this economy. And in the second piece, I try to provide uh, an explanation for what's going on. And so the key feature that I'm going to zoom in on is that urban production turns out to lead to very uneven outcomes. And so what we're gonna be focusing on is whether inequality in modern productive activity could potentially represent ex ante risk for rural households to have to go through this transition as part of the development process. And we're gonna see whether that can help us understand um, the direction of capital flows. I'm gonna show you a very simple model that um, is stylized, but hopefully will resonate with you and make some, some insights that you'll find useful. So um, there's a big literature and, and I don't have time to go through it all, but the, I think the, the important thing is, is to note that this capital flow puzzle is really a savings puzzle. So it's driven by households saving a lot and it's, it's kind of puzzling given that they grow rich so fast. And the other thing to note is that some of the most um, senior people here in the stack program have actually have worked on that and people usually focus on financial frictions uh, on the firm side and in recent work. And so I do something different. I um, have no such thing, but what I do have is I have idiosyncratic human capital risk and I don't allow you to insure for that. And so that's the side how financial frictions map for this, this paper. So the first thing is, so when I started this project, I thought, okay, this is gonna be so easy. You just measure saving rates for urban and rural houses and that's it. Now it turns out that saving rates, right, which um, would be a residual given your income and your consumption is actually really hard to measure. Suppose you buy a house and now somehow you take your cash and it turns into a physical asset. And then if you don't account for that properly, you end up with a saving rate of, I don't know, minus 400%. And so all that stuff. And so going through this process, I realized the other people in the field, they were actually focusing on asset to income ratios. And so the benefit of that is that the asset is the, is the stock concept that pertains to the flow of savings and it's kind of easier to measure. And so what I'm gonna show you is that this asset to income ratio is gonna be systematically different in urban rural households. We're gonna be focusing on financial assets, which is somewhat easier because you will have plenty of concerns about um, productive assets, of course, taken off in the urban centers. And so in that sense, what I show you today is gonna to connect to the literature on the demand for safe assets, something that, that Laura actually has worked quite, quite a lot on. And that seems to be an important aspect of the capital outflows that you say see in China. So to that end, I'll run um, a simple regression where I focus on median differences, where the uh, left-hand side is gonna be the asset to income ratio, and I should say financial asset to income ratio, and then controlling for a number of things. So when you look at the results, right, and I should say this is Chinese households from the Chinese family panel study in 2012. Um, I wanna focus on, on column one, where I have a simple um, dummy coefficient on the very first entry here, which is 0.161. And so if you try to put that into perspective, what that tells you is that urban households relative to rural ones have twice as high 
and financial asset to income ratio. So you could look at, think about your, your own income, all your financial assets, the way one by the other, and that's kind of what I'm looking at. Now that can turn out to be a really powerful thing because think about aggregate savings. They arise out of the interplay of how much I earn and how much of that I save. So given that urban households are twice as rich and they also save a whole lot more, you can start pondering whether the structural change can actually help you understand um, what's creating this uh, huge demand for safe assets along the growth market. Now, important thing that I do is I start controlling for a number of things and to see if the results are robust. Now, obviously none of this is causal, but you'd be probably really disappointed if I controlled for income or demographics and it would all go away. So it's robust to that end. Um, and it's also robust across a number of years. So you can do that with different types of data, all from China. You can use the chip, or you can use the CFPS and you can go, and it even works in the, in the 1990s and it works today. So urban rural differences um, are quite powerful and um, potentially help us understand, um, given that structural change changes extremely fast paced, where that uh, demand for safe assets is coming from. Now, um, as I go along, I'm gonna take a particular position. And my position is that these asset to income ratio differences are, dri are driven by uh, life being fundamentally more risky and urban productive activity. And so, there's some motivating evidence for that. If you look at this, this classic paper by um, Robert Townsend, where he shows magically that actually idiosyncratic income risk seems to be almost irrelevant in, in rural villages because the communities are so good at insuring each other relative to how um, income shocks pass through to consumption in um, modern economies, where say you can think of the, the incomplete market stuff and the Blandella Dal type exercises. Now, I want to point out that this difference, if you were to go to do the standard incomplete market stuff, wouldn't be strong enough to give capital outflows during a growth miracle. And so that's why it hasn't been done yet. It seems like a super low hanging fruit, but the problem is that the permanent income hypothesis, which makes you smooth um, over your future income is so powerful that the standard income risk that we measure on a period by period basis wouldn't be strong enough to give you anything like savings, um, given that China grows at 10%. Now, what is different though, is when you start thinking of all the inequality that is emerging in the urban economy, and you'd consider a rural household that ex ante wasn't sure where he or she would end up on the distribution. And so the first thing to notice that in fact, for uh, growth miracles in Taiwan and in China, there's actually massive inequality in, 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 in urban areas and urban production that has been growing along the transition path. And then the question is, or the, the proposition, that the, the hope that one can, can solve this puzzle is that if, if some of this inequality is ex ante unknown for rural households that um, are doing agricultural work and are very even in that, and then turn out to be extremely differentiated into winners and losers, then that turns out to be a powerful enough uh, motive to drive precautionary savings, even despite miraculously fast growth. And so here's a plot to just try to make this point where you see a shifting distribution. This is log household income in China. And you see every period, every decade it shifts to the right, which is the, the match for growth. And that's massive. But what you also see is this fanning out of the distribution along the, the transition path. And I'm gonna reinterpret that as ex ante risk. And we wanna see what that helps us to account for the, the growth miracle and the puzzling capital outflows. So to do that, I set up a simple theoretical model. And so to understand the model, let me run you through the three stages that households in this world are gonna go through. So first, most households start as rural households and the hand to mouth consumers. So that makes it easy for me. I don't really have to worry about their consumption smoothing problem. They do, however, endogenously decide whether and when to migrate to the city. And the city here stands in for urban production. And then in the city, and this is the, the key piece, households income grows, income grows very fast for some random time up until some random time T, which here stands in for the random time when you stop growing fast. Um, at a growth rate GH, which I don't think you can see right now, but it stands for G high, uh, high growth. And so the idea is that here, I introduce the catch up growth on the household level, which is really important. And I introduce catch up growth as itself an uneven process. You can get lucky and you enter this growth rocket and you keep growing for a long time 
you can get unlucky and you've been pulled out of this very quickly. And the way I pull you out is with a passant process that turns out to be extremely tractable. After the growth spurt is over, I'm going to hit this household with what I call an inequality shock. So there's this uneven distribution in the city, and some of it comes from unevenly distributed growth, and some of it comes from an additional type draw, like a lottery, that's going to push you up or down. And of course, this type draw is I sent it around once. So on average, it leaves the household um, income unchanged, but it can push you up or down, and that potentially is going to be a source of uh, precautionary savings. Once you stop growing uh, fast, you grow at the normal growth rate G star, which you can think of as 2% of the, uh, you know, you turn into an American household. And so the, the catch up is over. All of this, I should say, plays out on the individual household level. Now, I feel like that would be really hard to, to digest in a, in, a, in a talk. So let me just show you what life could look like in this world. The household starts at time zero, log of income plotted on the Y axis and then grows at a slow growth rate in the, on the countryside, and dodgingly decides to move, there might be an urban rural wage gap. This is something that other people in this program have done a lot of research on, and it, it would help me if there was one, because that would give me more catch-up growth. It would help me to solve the puzzle, but you can make that zero if you like. And then the key difference is that you have a different slope here in terms of income growth. And that represents catch-up. That's where the catch-up is coming from. That's where in the aggregate, you see this economy converging to the United States. Then eventually you're being randomly pulled out of that uh, random catch-up growth and you draw your additional type that represents human capital risk and urban productivity and that can push you up or down and here i'll show you an example with a lucky household that gets pushed up but of course the important thing is you might actually be pushed down which could leave you worse off for some time so let me com com uh, complete the description of the model uh, it's a small open economy model it's a dual economy model with an urban and rural sector there's perfect competition. So there's nothing going on on the firm side that would be uh, interesting for what I do. Time is continuous. And importantly, this is an infinite horizon problem. So if I give you that growth miracle, the fact that I use the infinite horizon makes it harder for me because then all the households foresee the potential aggregate growth miracle and want to smooth against it. Um, utility is standard, this is CRA. And uh, of course, it would be easier to solve that puzzle with um, when you start playing around with the utility function and this plenty of, of things and tricks. But here I'm kind of taking the hardest possible way to solve it, which is just a standard CRA utility. Uh, there's an interest rate, R star, and there's discount factor row. And the interest rate is pinned down on the balanced growth path of the rest of the world the industrialized country. And so this line here, you'll realize comes straight out of, straight out of the oil equation if you had a economy growing without risk. Now, let me complete the production structure and then, then we're almost done, set up the model. There's one factor of production. So in this baseline version, I don't have capital. And this is really zooming in on the household that wants to, uh, that ponders whether they should smooth consumption or whether they should um, build up savings. And so in that sense, it's a hugged economy. Uh, urban production is constant returns to scale and turns human capital into output with a normalized price of unity. And the important piece here is that I'm gonna introduce productivity growth here in this solar neutral productivity shifter. And that's gonna then matter for structural change. Uh, real production is decreasing returns to scale. And so you can think of that as Cobb Douglas with a fixed factor of land. And so now you can already see here, this is a really the most simple model of structural change, right? There's, um, this most sophisticated versions, but here what I, all I want to do is generate is a continuous flow of people out of the rural sector into the urban economy. And I do get exactly that because of the curvature on the rural production function. I give you productivity growth in the city. So the wage goes up and people keep moving in, but there will always be some who optimally decide to stay on the countryside precisely because when you're the last person left, you have plenty of land at your disposal and you'll still be rich. So that's kind of how it works. Um, of course, I need to allow at some point households to smooth consumption or to build up savings. Otherwise, the paper will be really uninteresting. And so the key thing where that happens is when you enter the city, then the household has access to this internationally traded risk-free bond. And here you see a household budget constraint in continuous time. I think you've all seen that where the, there's a little dot over the A. I hope you can see that. So that's a, the time derivative. And of course, the, the saving change depending on the return on the safe asset, your income and the consumption choice that the household makes. 
So this is really stylized model, but it leads to an extremely tractable representation of this whole problem of this whole infinite horizon structural change setting, where in the end, everything reduces to a very simple Euler equation that we'll be able to say a lot about just from math theory. So if you um, solve all the math with the Poisson process and the type draw and, and all that, uh, you get this Euler equation here in the bottom where the right piece of it, R, R star minus rho over eta, you all have seen that. That's the standard piece that you get in any neoclassical economy. But the piece in the middle here is the difference. And this is the piece that um, shows up because I do two things, because I introduce the inequality draw and because I make growth itself uneven and risky. And so both features are absolutely central for this piece to show up. If you don't have this inequality draw, you're not gonna have this expectation around the ratios of consumption that you ponder will you'll have to choose once you draw your type. Equally, if you don't have this uneven growth and sort of that may be actually the most surprising thing, if I don't give you that uneven growth, I say you look, you're gonna grow for 10 years really fast, but then at 10 years in, you're gonna draw that type. The neoclassical agent would still choose a completely stable consumption path given by R star minus rho over eta. You may build up precautionary savings or not, but whatever you do, you jump at zero and then you get this extreme smoothing. And so you need both pieces and these two pieces then can make for an interesting discussion of consumption smoothing forces on the one hand and precautionary saving forces on the other. So um, in the paper, I go through all that, all that stuff in detail, but there's really one key sufficient statistic that comes out of that simple model that summarizes kind of all I do. It turns out that whether you see capital outflows or not along the transition path, of course, trivially depends on the cons consumption smoothing on the one hand and on the inequality risk on the other. And so it turns out to reduce to the simple sufficient statistic um, that, we, that, we that we'll analyze in detail. So on the left hand side for this inequality, you see the consumption smoothing force. And so what you have here is the growth differential of the catch-up economy with respect to the United States. So that's GH minus G star over Lambda. And so if you remember your stochastic processes class, you, you remember that one over Lambda is the average time spent in this, what I call the high growth regime for a household. And so that kind of summarizes, condenses all the consumption smoothing that a rationally um, forward-looking household might want to do in this economy. Then on the right-hand side, I have this inequality risk type drop. And so the first thing to note is that this right-hand side is always greater to zero by assumption. And you could show that using Jensen's inequality and the fact that this thing is uh, the, the type draw is centered around unity. Now, whether you get capital outflows or not then depends on how uneven that growth miracle is. There's no reason why the right-hand side has to be greater than the left-hand side. And so in that sense, the model is agnostic, but then once you feed in data, once you tell me how uneven the growth miracle is going to be, um, then I'll be in a position to tell you exactly whether along the transition path, this economy is going to display capital inflows or capital out outflows. I want to point to one interesting thing in this model, even though it's stylized, that connects to what people have done before. Um, and so that will be the standard incomplete market literature. And the classic reference here is Carroll's paper in 1979. 1997, apologies, or the paper by Joy Kabowski and, and Townsend, which maybe is the most beautiful application of macro development of an incomplete market model. So in those papers, all the households grow at the same rate G. And that turns out to be quantitatively really troubling. When you give everyone the same catch-up growth, the consumption's moving force turns out to almost always dominate um, precautionary savings. Now, the key difference here is that I make growth itself uneven. Some, some households grow a lot, catch up a lot, and others don't. And I do that in a Poisson process. And so that turns out to break this powerful consumption moving force that otherwise has dominated all the incomplete market literature on this question. And so the intuition for this is as follows. So take my word for it that this income process is going to lead to a fat-tailed income distribution. A lot of aggregate growth is going to come from the emergence of a fat right tail. And that's going to show up very powerfully if you measure income growth in an economy over time. Now, for every individual household with a curvature on the utility function, they're heavily going to discount the possibility of ending up as a billionaire, even though on average, some people do, and they do matter in the aggregate. 
And so that interaction, that uneven growth that is risky in and of itself, makes it possible to, to tackle the consumption um, smoothing puzzle, the capital flow puzzle here. So here's one way where you can see that really quick. Um, the income distribution in the end is going to have a tail that is going to be governed by lambda over gh minus g star. And so now you could see what happens if you let gh minus g star over lambda converge to one. And you have a Pareto distribution where the expectation isn't well defined, just growth explodes. From a consumption smoothing point for any individual household, still, I mean, yeah, the consumption smoothing force will go up a little. It's encoded in this piece here, but it certainly wouldn't explode at all. And so in that sense, making growth uneven and risky is kind of a key feature that you, that you can see coming out of this model that, that I think might be relevant for other people who try to tackle uh, similar problems as well. I shall note though, that if you don't have this inequality draw, you will still never be able to generate capital outflows just because even if I make your growth risky, there's gotta be a chance that in the future you're worse off than today. If not, then it's not gonna work. So these two things, they're really the interplay of these two uh, is important and it's the most simple way to get something that looks realistic in the aggregate. So let me calibrate this very simple model. And so to calibrate the key things that I think you wanna know about is okay, what I do about inequality. I have these two sources, uneven growth and this type shock. And both of them together, if I add them up, I want this economy to look something like the United States in terms of inequality. So I'm gonna say you usher into a very uneven future. And this might be quite relevant for the case of China or Taiwan. The other thing that you wanna know about is how big is the growth market gonna be? You know, if I make it arbitrarily big, it's gonna be very hard for me to solve this capital flow puzzle pre precisely because I do still have a consumption smoothing force in the model. And so here, I'm actually gonna give you a very serious growth miracle that, that I think is bigger than what most people would consider in the literature, which is I'm gonna increase relative GDP per capita relative to the United States by a factor of six. So that's really massive. And um, so that means I have to choose the growth rate and the Poisson process accordingly. And I shall say that um, the urban rural wage gap, I set it to, to 100%. So that's like doubling your income just from people moving in and out. And we should certainly discuss more whether you, you find this is a good assumption or not. You can take that out without problem. And then you have the catch up is still three times. Or you might say, well, this is actually really a long run model and a very, very long run. Even though if I have my micro uh, regression right now and a control for selection doesn't seem so big in the very long run, you think that lots of people on the countryside will actually turn out to be more productive in, in the city. And so that idea is captured here in an urban rural wage gap of 100%. And that adds to aggregate growth. So let me show you what the growth miracle looks like. So I said, this is a bit of a stylized income process, but at least in the aggregate, you can integrate it out really nicely. And then it looks like a smooth thing that uh, I think looks a lot like Taiwan if you were to uh, filter through the business cycle variation. And you see this strong catch up to the United States that peters out eventually. The more interesting thing, of course, is the capital flows, because I said I was going to, uh, you know, I was going to tackle a capital flow puzzle. So here I show you what the current account to GDP ratio would look like in this model economy. And note that the aggregate saving rate and the current account to GDP ratio really are the same thing because they don't have capital in this model, right? And so then there's this risk free international trade, a bond, and so it shows up in the saving rate and, and the current account to GDP ratio just the same. Now, you may, you know, you may wonder why I think this is so cool, but I think this is really cool because I get hump shape. And it turns out that getting hump shaped saving rates is a really hard thing to get. And if you look at growth miracles, a lot of the time you do see a qualitative, really nice hump shape emerging. And what people have done in the past to rationalize this, they have introduced something like habit and consumption or other financial frictions on the firm side. And here I get it for a very different reason. Um, the reason that I get it is that structural change can help me through compositional effects to shift the demand for safe assets over time in a way that will give me a hump shape. So what's happening is that people it keep is. moving into the city and as they keep moving into the city, they drive up the demand for safe assets. But eventually all the uncertainty is resolved and you move out of that, um, that, that growth state where you want to accumulate a buffer stock savings. And so this, depending on the parameterization of the problem at hand, can lead to something uh, like a hump-shaped saving rate. Um, so that's that. Um, and 
you know, an, an answer to, to the Lucas puzzle. So this is what I've uh, prepared for today. So, so let me conclude. In this paper, I suggest that there might be a relationship between structural change and savings pressure. I try to show you that empirically, savings, especially for financial assets, are much higher in urban areas and for urban households after controlling for a number of things. Um, my interpretation of that is that through the lens of a precautionary savings model, there must be massive ri risk in uh, urban productive activity. And so then I, I try to model that. And in the, in the process of that, I realized that the, dis the distributional aspect of the growth miracle is really important. And the most surprising thing to me is that growth itself must be unevenly distributed. Then you get action from the tail that interacts with the consumption smoothing force very differently than what you get if you let everyone catch up to the United States. Um, so then future work, I think, is, is going to go beyond this, this stylized case. And I'm going to do more careful measurement of human capital risk. And I'm going to work more on the intergenerational uh, aspect of risk that I think is maybe interesting about urban rural differences as well. Um, but for now, I hope you'll find some pieces of this, this project interesting. And, and, um, and that's what I have today. Thanks very much for, for listening. Great. Uh, a great presentation. Very clear. It's a good thing we have a little bit of extra time. There's a, a lot of action in the chat. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, sort of, I, yeah. I, no, it's fine, yeah. I collected some theme of questions, uh, but let me see if someone, uh, do we have hands? Anyone wants to ask? We have broad set of questions. Some are related to the matching or the relation between assets and savings. There were questions from a mechanical point of view, what is that relation? But they were also more empirical. Uh, for example, Paul, Paula asked if you're uh, picking up land. There was another question by Steve uh, um, that I think also had uh, some related questions. This relative risk between urban and rural, I know there was a paper that found some evidence, but it seemed that that requires a little bit more. It doesn't seem to be so obvious. Um, and a broader one, uh, and here my apologies for doing the, the annoying thing of actually citing a different paper from the one that you're citing, but relates to the more macro facts. Mm -hmm. And so this puzzle, if you consider the fact that a lot of the countries that get capital but have negative growth are actually getting World Bank aid or loans, it goes away. If you consider that a lot of the countries that have also the opposite because they're saving, have a lot of reserve accumulation by the government, it also goes away. Uh, so in general, there were questions about the matching. How does your model lead to capital flows? But a general one is that you don't have government um, that plays a big role. This is also a time where China had a lot of restrictions. There was capital control. Right. There were restrictions on mobility. There was also safety net offered through government. Uh, so, so there's a lot of like micro questions about China, but more general about the, the macro uh, matching. Right. So, so let me give you a little bit of time and see if someone else was to ask. So, so yes, yeah, so let me try to address a few of the points. So the political economy side of it is super interesting and then there's a lot of work and reserve accumulation was mentioned and, and foreign aid. So what, what remains a problem for... A model with a forward-looking, forward-looking agents is that you just go look at the household level data in China, and you see saving rates that are way higher than what you would see in the United States. And so you take out the firms and you take out the entrepreneurs, and yet somehow people think for them is optimally to accumulate savings. And so I think that my paper uh, offers a way to look at that that somewhat is still orthogonal to many of the. Uh, capital control frictions that were mentioned and, and other issues in foreign aid. But I completely agree that um, on, a, on a macro point of view, there's many other things that matter. And most certainly the, the economies that say, I think mostly Africa, where you have a lot of foreign flows, that wouldn't be a, a good way to apply my model at all. So I, I want to agree with that for sure. Um, let's see. So, so many questions and I have a hard time pick. If anyone wants to uh, read out I, a I, question. Yeah, another one before I, I open up to Joe was, was this about the, the risk urban and rural. It was asked by Steve, but, but, uh, but also uh, there was a mention that the data panel for China uh, 
actually does suggest the opposite, that income is riskier in agriculture in, in China. So, so there, there's a few points. So if you look, so I think, I wonder if, if the, the people have in mind the paper, uh, the price of consumption, consumption, the AJ macro, that's I think the most recent one that I can think of that looks at uh, income volatility and path through to consumption. And so when you go back way in time, the urban communities were really uh, safe in the sense that the shock to income didn't pass through. And I think that's what I have in mind, sort of the, the, the Rob Townsend literature that finds that um, this pass through is almost non-existent on the countryside for an idiosyncratic shock. And then, of course, along the transition path, I think the model, in a way, it's hard to match it to the data because you'll see changes within urban areas in China. You'll see changes within rural areas. They become a little more urban. What if you do... Um, if you become an economist in the, in the rural and so, area and so on and so forth. So then it, it gets a little hard to match, but I would say that the key feature that I think is true is that when you have really rural communities, life is stable. Now you can get unlucky with the weather for sure, but at the end of the day, you'll turn out, you'll stay within your community and you'll do what your father or your mother did and you continue that family line. Well, when you're in a um, modern society, you have a lot of churn, a lot of fluctuation. And I have very little knowledge about what my future holds at this point. I am still a PhD student. And so that heterogeneity is powerful enough to give a solution to the puzzle. And that's kind of where I'm trying to go with this paper. Um, could, I, could I follow up on, on that one? So yes. I also want when I mentioned about the, the facts. So you mentioned about the price of growth. That, that is all about urban. So it's an increase in inequality among the urban households. So it's, it's nothing, not much to do with rural urban migration. And also, I guess the general question is about your paper. It seems that this is kind of a neat idea about this uh, heterogeneity, about the expectation about the growth. And that seems uh, will able to generate a high saving rate. And uh, so I'm not sure uh, how important really is uh, the, the rural urban aspect of your paper. So I, um, I actually, is yeah. it, 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 because, because the, you can generate a high, because no, of yeah. the way you generate the growth process uh, in equality, you can generate a high saving rate. The so rural urban is just to get the initial rise for the, for the composition effects. That's how it does. No, I, I, so perfect. Yeah, that's precisely right. So it gives me a nice compositional effect. And it kind of comes out of the idea that um, there's differences in the way we interact and produce. But you're right that if you go to China in 1988, and then there's, there's very little heterogeneity in urban production. And so then you could say, well, that, mm -hmm. you know, the model doesn't add up. So kind of you, you need the growth miracle to create that urban inequality. And then you can start wondering whether actually the structural change, whether this is important or not, because that one that in the urban center that used to say work for the state government now has to go through this mm -hmm. uneven pros growth process. So yeah, I agree with you. That's, that's really the, the key piece of the paper, I agree. Yeah, thanks for clarifying yeah, so that. Right. So, so I guess, I mean, in the case of China, there are composition effects even within the urban areas. You may be able, so in other words, you, you, you may not rely so much on the rural urban difference. That there's a lot of question about which one is risky and so on. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but, but uh, I think this is about uh, different opportunities uh, for the, I think that, that's, a, that's very neat. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, let me, let me, uh, Joe and then Todd. Yeah, um, a very interesting uh, paper. I apologize, I, I, I arrived a few minutes late. Um, if you could send me the slides, I would, I would appreciate it. But I had a question about the relationship between sort of the economics in your model and um, these models of uh, entrepreneurship, credit constrained entrepreneurship. Um, I think like some of the, you know, like the Growing Like China uh, mm -hmm. paper, the Boris right. uh, paper, seems somewhat related and I was, absolutely yeah and uh um i was going to mention I, I mentioned one other thing in the chat which is not really a question but uh, paco has a paper about these models at the micro level and um putting in epstein's in preferences and it just seems to me like it might be something interesting i mean there's a uh maybe a very tertiary uh extension because the two forces you had, you know, one's intertemporal substitution and the other is yeah. risk aversion. So distinguishing those two would be kind of interesting. Absolutely. So in a way, I, 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 I advertise this tying my hands. Of course, it becomes way easier to solve this puzzle once you start playing around with the utility function. And so one classic way of doing that is separate out 
risk from intertemporal elasticity of substitution. And I, I should look more into that for sure. Thanks very much. Yeah, just to be able to understand the mechanics, but also uh, the, the bigger question was, uh, how does this relate to that existing literature? Is it, I mean, on the, the weakest way, it might say, well, you, you're kind of just relabeling things, but a lot of the economics are the same. Um, that, that's not the most charitable. I don't think that's the, the, the most honest either. So I've just given you a chance to sort of like say, how does yeah. it relate? So one thing that, uh, that maybe is, is, is complementary to that work, and, and I love that work, so I've been starting thinking about this, reading that papers for sure, is um, that the financial friction on the film side isn't driving everything. So if you take that out of their models, like everything's gone, right? And so in that sense, what you need here is that human capital has idiosyncratic risk that you can't insure. Then on top of that, in a way, the models work a little similar that what's driving, if I get this right, I hope Paco doesn't correct me, but if what's driving savings in, in Paco's paper uh, is also that um, there's entrepreneurs that used to make state-owned companies that used to be big that are going to be small in the future, and they actually have an incentive to build up savings. And so here, it's a little different in the sense that no one's going to know where they land. And the key difference that I think might be interesting beyond all of the other stuff is that once you start introducing uneven growth, so make the catch-up risky, that was actually the most surprising thing for me that that quantitatively, that really, you need to do that when you do what I do. Otherwise, if you let them all catch up the same and then you introduce that type draw, you need crazy numbers to make it work. Todd, let me, uh, yeah. Just checking there's no other questions so that we can collect that, that last set of questions. Todd? Thanks. Um, I guess what I thought was missing here is you're, you're, you're talking a lot about something called human capital risk. And you know, often when we look empirically for risk, we do something like the variance of the change in log income. And yes. I think you probably, you mean something more, you're clearly from the words, you mean something longer run, some, some more, but there's no measurement of that. And I think that's kind of what's really missing here and what would help us be a lot more convincing in the sense that, you know, if I think about the, the literature on labor income processes, they talk about things like HIP versus RIP and what's the covariance of income over a five-year period or a 10-year period. Or, uh, there is panel data for developing countries, you know, people have this. And so I, I think it would be really useful for you to, take a stronger stand on exactly what you mean so that I don't have to kind of try to guess at it and then show me yeah. a little bit of data about it. Um, so I, I want to completely agree with that. So this is kind of where I want to, I think it's going to be a new paper, but it's going to be that properly, if you will, where, um, so right now I'm just saying kind of, there's all that heterogeneity. I separate this all into only two things and the heterogeneity on the macro level, you can measure it well, or sort of on the cross-section household level. And then I use that and I see that, that, that it works. And so then I learn a little bit about what, what I need to make it work. And so in that sense, it's useful. But you're right that um, I don't have any compelling evidence that what you really worry about is that what is known and what isn't. So that's like you saying, I need to take a stance on the income process and then try to measure it. Because if everything, say, were to be known in advance, then that it wouldn't work at all. And so I think, um, I think I'm going to work toward the, the things that you suggested for sure. So thanks for that comment. Great. As I mentioned, there is a very active chat. And I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you can have a look at, or the organizers can, can send it. Since we have a very tight schedule, let me invite the next author to share uh, his slides. Okay. Can okay. you go ahead? Sorry. Yes, we can see your slides. So the next you... paper is Forgone Investment, Civil Conflict and Agriculture Credit in Colombia by Luis uh, Martin. Thank you, uh, Laura, and thank you to the organizers of this amazing conference for including our paper in the program. This is joint work with Nicolas de Roux from Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, who is here in the audience and can, can help answer some questions you may have if you post them in the chat as we go along. And so, uh, let's do it like this. So the main question that we try to answer in this paper is whether producers forgo otherwise profitable investments due to civil conflict. And we think that this is an interesting question to answer insofar as foregone investment may lead to low levels of economic growth, something that people in this audience I think care a lot about, and also to persistent renewed cycles of violence. But until now, the effect of conflict on investment uh, remains unclear, both in terms of its sign and its magnitude. 
while it might seem intuitive that investors fear their capital being expropriated by armed groups, that investors fear their capital being destroyed amid fighting, it could also be the case that certain types of productive, productive activities actually thrive in a conflict uh, environment. So it's not clear. Now, answering this question faces two major empirical challenges. The first one is a measurement one, and it has to do with the fact that measuring willingness to invest is actually quite hard. If I show you in some aggregate data that areas with conflict tend to have lower levels of investment, we will always wonder whether that is because people actually don't want to invest or whether it is the case because no one is willing to lend to them, perhaps due to credit market imperfections or some type of friction, which we know tend to be prevalent in rural areas in the development in the developing world. The other challenge is a more conventional identification challenge. After all, armed groups predominantly operate in remote areas with poor infrastructure, rugged terrain, weak state presence. And so if we see that investment is low in those areas, it will always be hard to tell us whether this is due to conflict or whether this is due to one of these correlated characteristics. At the same time, we think that this actually adds to the appeal of the research question to the extent that it is not at all obvious whether conflict is the binding constraint on investment in this type of environment. In other words, if we take conflict out of the equation, will we really observe some type of economic boom? And in particular, what we're interested in here, some type of investment uh, boom. So what we do in the paper, in a nutshell, is we study the effect of civil conflict on the demand for uh, credit by Colombian farmers. And for this purpose, we use administrative data on the universe of business loans to small producers by Colombia's largest agricultural bank. And our sample period will go from 2009 to 2019. Now our empirical strategy exploits cross-sectional variation in exposure to conflict coming from differences across municipalities in historical presence by insurgent group FARC. And we will also exploit time variation coming from the 2016 peace agreement between the Colombian government and this insurgent group in a very conventional difference in difference framework. Now to shed light on mechanisms, we use detailed data on the characteristics of loan applicants, on the characteristics of loans, and on some outcomes, including things like delinquency rates. And we use a very simple, very stylized model of investment to, to try to, to guide us through that. The main takeaway from the paper is that for producers seem to forego what are sizable and arguably profitable investments due to conflict. And we see that in these conflict areas after the peace deal, there is a roughly 17% increase over the sample mean in monthly credit disbursements with no change importantly in default rates or in the misuse of loans. I'll talk about that later on. Okay, so this paper, of course, sits at the intersection of the literatures on civil conflict and the literature on agriculture and, and credit markets in developing countries. Regarding conflict, the literature on the economic costs of conflict is relatively underdeveloped. And what I mean by that is that in recent years, in recent decades, we have learned a lot about the causes of conflict, about what contributes to conflict, but we have learned much less about what the effects and the consequences of conflict are. And I'm, we're citing there some, some well-known papers in that regard. Now, it is true that there is a handful of papers that document interesting patterns in terms of changes in patterns of rural production, asset composition that seem to correlate with conflict. But most of that previous work, A, relies on surveys and there may be, may be measurement issues there, and B has, has struggled to, to establish causality. There is of course a booming literature on the Colombian peace agreement that has not previously tackled the topic of investment and we contribute to that. Now, the literature on rural financial markets in developing countries, our reading of it is that it has predominantly focused on market imperfections and the role that that plays on, on interesting outcomes. What we bring to the table is we document conflict as an, as an important factor that disrupts investment decisions by farmers in these, in these rural areas. So uh, in the remaining 25 minutes, I'll give you a bit of background. I'll walk you through our empirical strategy, show you the main results, talk a bit about mechanisms, 
and wrap up. Regarding background, so Colombia was embroiled in this very long 50 plus year long conflict that was very bloody, very deadly. It is estimated that over 200,000 people died as a result of the conflict. Perhaps the main protagonist was FARC, which was a Marxist insurgency created in the 1960s. And FARC during its early decades, so think 1970s, early 1980s, it was involved in very low intensity fighting and it relied basically on local extortion of local landowners and you know, local businesses for its survival. The Colombian conflict really picks up in the late 1980s and the 1990s when FARC's involvement with the drug trade increases, when right-wing paramilitary groups arrive and so on. And FARC's expansion in the 1990s leads to a peace effort in the, in the late 1990s that eventually fails and is followed by a strong counterinsurgent military campaign. So if you want the timeline of the conflict, think of the late 80s and 1990s as a period of expansion of this insurgent group and think of the 2000s as a period of like retreat and, and, and contraction. In 2012, the government begins peace negotiations and these culminate in a successful agreement in 2016. Now, what does the peace deal entail? On the one hand, FARC agrees to lay down their weapons. They agree to abandon their involvement in the drug trade. And they also agree to help in efforts regarding demining, truth telling, things like that. In return, FARC gets some temporary seats in Congress and also this whole transitional justice system is put in place to deal with crimes and atrocities committed uh, during the conflict. Importantly, uh, one whole chapter of the peace deal concerns rural development and the government does commit to implement a series of policies, although there are not a lot of like very specific targets there. So in our analysis, we will pay some attention to figuring out whether what we're observing is the result of just government policies that are changing due to peace rather than some response on the private side by producers that are, that are willing to invest more. Even though the peace negotiations begin in 2012, in fact, in June 2011, the national government already reveals a renewed interest in peace when it signs into law a victim's bill. And this victim's bill allows people that have been victimized by the conflict to seek reparations. And if they had to, if they lost their land, they can also seek land restitution. And I mentioned this because it's gonna matter in a couple of different ways that I'll, I'll highlight in a few minutes. Now, the bank that we work with, uh, Banco Agrario de Colombia, Colombia's agricultural bank, uh, is, is a public bank that is required to allocate at least 70% of its portfolio to agricultural activities. And the agricultural credit market in Colombia ends up being very segmented. And so BAC is the main source of credit for small producers, capturing 93% of the segment in 2019. And it's the bank that has presence in, 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 in a bigger set of municipalities in the country. Almost 95% of the country is covered by this bank. So this is just to say that BAC is not really competing with private banks for these, for these customers. The private banks are not really interested. They cater to bigger agro-industrial firms and so on. So BAC almost has a monopoly here. Now, where does BAC get, get its resources? BAC allocates rediscount resources from a second tier public bank called Pinagro. What are the implications of this? Well, this these Pinagro funded loans, they have subsidized and regulated interest rates. There's not a lot of action there. If farmers, if producers do not have their own assets to put down as collateral, the government guarantees these loans. But also, interestingly, Pinagro requires a subset of loans to be audited. And what this means is that if you told me you were gonna buy a tractor with this loan, I have these officers that go to your farm and say, where's the tractor and take pictures and they look at their receipts and so on. So this will be interesting. So I'm just mentioning this because to us, this also adds to the appeal of the research question, because given these conditions, you might worry about inefficient allocation of capital, about whether back does, you know, does it lose a lot of money? Are these loans being repaid? And so I'll, I'll show you some results on that down the line. Now to talk about our, our empirical strategy, 
uh, we measure exposure to FARC. So this is the cross-sectional variation that we will exploit using an event-based conflict data set produced by Universidad del Rosario in Bogota. And what we do is remember that our credit data begins in 2009. And so we look at the previous decade, in fact, the previous 12, 13 years, and we do something very simple. Using this conflict data set, we just add up the total number of FARC attacks occurring in each municipality in those previous 10, 13 years, and we normalize by population. And then our preferred measure of FARC exposure is based on this continuous predetermined measure of FARC activity. We just take those municipalities in the upper quartile. And we say, these are the, the FARC intents. These are the FARC municipalities. Now, as part of our robustness checks, we verify that results are robust to playing around with this cutoff, to using the continuous measure, to changing the set of years that we use to define exposure, to using an alternative data set to define exposure, all of these things. The map on the right is showing you in red the municipalities that deem as being highly exposed to FARC. And for people like myself that have been studying the conflict for a while, this kind of makes sense. So what you have here, these areas in red include uh, the area near the border with Venezuela here in the east, includes the jungles in the Pacific here in the west near the border with Panama, and also includes this area, which is a combination of like plains and jungle in the south of the country. Uh, when the 1990s peace process took place, FARC was awarded a demilitarized zone somewhere around here. So this is what people in Colombia tend to think as, as you know, FARC heartland, if you, if you wish. As I mentioned before, uh, we use granular admin data from these agricultural bank. This is every single business loan that the bank awards to small producers, small producers defined in terms of assets and income between 2009 and 2019. So we're talking here about almost 3 million loans coming from almost 1.7 million applicants. Some features of our data that are worth highlighting are that our data starts at the application stage. So we don't just get to see loans that actually materialize, but we actually get to see applications, which provides an early indication of whether we're picking up, you know, increased demand for credit rather than something else. We get to see credit scores. We get to see delinquency rates. Uh, a bunch of different things. Some of our results you will see have a shorter sample period. And that's because the data from the bank scoring models we only have since 2012, when they were implemented, the, the more recent ones, I believe. Most outcomes we aggregate at the municipality month level and we normalize by population. So, you know, the, the map on the right is showing you in the aggregate, in the cross section, aggregate loan applications per 10,000 inhabitants. As you can see, loan applications tend to be higher. I don't know if you can see my, my mouse pointer in the mountainous area here in the center of the country, which is more developed, more densely populated and so on. So cross-sectionally, if anything, there seems to be like a negative correlation between uh, conflict and demand for credit, but that's what we want to use a more rigorous analysis to figure out. So our empirical strategy basically involves comparing areas with different exposure to FARC historically before and after the peace deal. Our workhorse specification is the one that I'm showing you here, where Y is some outcome, alpha I and delta JT are municipality and department month fixed effects. And you will see that in most tables, I will show you two separate difference in difference coefficients beta one and beta two. Beta two is our main coefficient of interest, which is, comes from the interaction between this cross-sectional measure of FARC exposure interacted with the months corresponding to the period after the final peace deal in November 2016. However, the peace deal doesn't just come out of the blue. The peace deal is the result of a years-long negotiation process. And so to, to see whether there is some anticipation effect during this interim negotiations phase, in most of our analysis, we also include an additional coefficient that picks up the effect in this interim negotiations phase. And here, to be conservative, we set the start of this period to be June of 2011 when the victim's law was passed, but results don't change very much. If we use the actual date when the negotiations start or if we move that around uh, a bit. We include some additional controls 
uh, to take into account, you know, cross-sectional differences between FARC and non-FARC municipalities that may be affecting things. Over time, we cluster our standard errors two-way by municipality and department year to take into account both serial correlation and also a bit of spatial correlation uh, in our outcomes of interest. So let me show you some results. So this graph is an event study plot uh, where the x-axis corresponds to years, calendar years, and the y-axis is a measure of conflict, conflict events per 10,000 inhabitants. So you can think of this plot as showing you the first stage where we're trying to show you whether the peace negotiations and the peace deal actually led to a reduction in the intensity of conflict in these FARC municipalities. And as you can see, this conflict uh, data that we're using here is only available at the year level. So that's why that is the unit of observation. But the big takeaway is that you can see that conflict in FARC municipalities remains relatively stable until 2012 when the negotiations begin, and then it steadily declines. And it stabilizes at a much lower level than, than it was before after the final peace agreement. Now, these conflict events include you know, attacks, ambushes, kidnappings, homicides, recruitment of minors, sexual violence. And so this is good news. This is telling us that indeed these hard hit areas experience a reduction in conflict intensity as the peace process unfolds. This other event study captures perhaps the main result of the paper. So the unit of observation is now municipality month using our granular data from back. The dependent variable is the loan application rate, loan applications per 10,000 uh, inhabitants. And what you can see is that this loan application rate and the, the, the solid blue line is the moving average of the estimated coefficients. And so the big takeaway is that you can see that the loan application rate remains relatively stable throughout the pre-period and the negotiations period, and but systematically increases after the peace agreement. Now, to show you this in table format, you can look at it here. So these are results from that specification that I showed you some minutes ago. In columns one, two, and three, the dependent variable is again the loan application rate. Column one is showing you the simplest difference in difference just with the municipality and time fixed effects. And so you can see that FARC municipalities after the agreement experience an increase of approximately 2.3 extra loan applications relative to a sample mean of 17, 18. So that's like a 13% increase. When we add additional controls, this doesn't really change. And when we allow for this anticipation effect, you can see that there's not a lot of evidence for it in column three. Now to us, that is one first result worth highlighting, which is that even though the intensity of conflict is decreasing during the negotiations period, investment and the demand for credit only seem to pick up after the peace deal is finalized. And so to us, this says that farmers are more responsive to the prospect of renewed violence to what's going to happen than to contemporary levels, which they know can change at any time if the peace process implodes or something. Column four is looking not at loan applications, but at loans dispersed. And so this is just to convince you that these, these loan applications translate into actual loans that are being approved and dispersed. And column five is looking not at the number of loans, but at the value, the amount of money that the bank is injecting as credit into these municipalities. And this is a sizable effect. So as it says down here, we're measuring this in constant Colombian, millions of Colombian pesos. If you translate this to dollars using the PPP exchange rate, this is approximately $15,000 per month per 10,000 inhabitants that are being injected in extra credit. Now, I won't bore you with robustness checks. I won't spend my last 10 minutes on that, but we verify that these results are robust to a bunch of different things. Let me just highlight that we, we worry especially about imbalancing covariates and dynamic effects that that could have. So not only do we use our baseline controls, we also use lasso regressions to pick the optimal set of controls, and we use propensity score weights, uh, propensity score weighted regressions to, as an alternative to, to deal. Uh, with this. So in my last 10 minutes, let me talk a bit about the mechanisms and conclude. 
So to guide our discussion, we use the simplest, the most stylized model of investment that you can think of. So think of a world in which a farmer has a CRRA utility function that depends on wealth W. And imagine that this farmer is faced with an investment opportunity that has some cost C, but requires taking out a loan, either because farmer's wealth is insufficient or it is not liquid enough. Now the cost, of the loan B depends of course on the size, how big it is, the interest rate and how costly it is to apply. Where application costs could be fees that you have to pay, paperwork that you have to provide, or literally the cost of driving three hours to the nearest bank branch to, to submit an application. The project, it's a very simple uh, structure. The project succeeds with some probability Q in which case it yields a positive return R and it fails with a probability one minus Q, in which case you face a cost K larger than zero. You can think of this cost as capturing wealth that you lost, either because you invested directly or because you lost some collateral because you didn't pay your loan. You can also think of this as the reputational cost from having a lower credit score because you defaulted on your loan. And so based on this very simple uh, environment, we get some indifference condition for investment, given some initial wealth, where of course you will invest if the expected return, if the expected utility of investment exceeds the, the fixed utility from just doing nothing. Now, the big takeaway here is unsurprisingly that the probability of investment or investment in general increases when the return is higher, when the probability of success is higher, when you're richer, that's because of the CRA utility function, and it is decreasing in row, more risk averse people invest less, and it is decreasing in B. The costlier it is to get the loan, the less likely it is to invest. Now, I mentioned this because these parameters at the bottom, some of them we get to observe, we see interest rates, but many we don't. And so the question as I walk you through some additional results is how can we map the stuff that we can observe into these parameters and what is actually moving around here? Where moving around could mean uh, that conflict directly affects one of these parameters. It could also mean that one of these parameters is an underlying source of heterogeneity and that those are the people that are being selected into investment or out of investment. So first of all, and let me speed up a bit, this table is meant to convince you that the increase in the demand for credit is not driven by supply side factors. And so we consider, we do things like controlling for proximity to the nearest back branch. We do things like looking at approval rates and approval rates we do in two ways, looking at the average at the municipality month level, but also in columns four and five approval rates at the individual level, controlling for a bunch of individual characteristics. As you can see, approval rates are not changing and so on. Average interest rates, unsurprisingly, given what I told you before, are also not changing. So these loans have unchanged interest rate unchanged approval rate. They don't really seem to be driven by branch expansions or something like that. <coughs> now, looking at the characteristics of applicants, we see in column one an increase in the share of new bank clients that had never applied for a loan before. And in column four, we see that the, the pool of applicants has slightly uh, lower average wealth than it did uh, before. Now, what could these results be telling us? Well, on the one hand, the changes in demographics could be saying something about risk aversion or project returns, but the change in wealth is quite interesting because it suggests that either it is poorer farmers, the ones that were foregoing investment before peace and are the ones that are stepping in. It could also mean that it is poorer farmers, the ones that were more exposed to conflict within municipalities. So you can imagine- Five minutes, that the... sorry, five minutes. Great, great, thank you, Laura. So you can imagine that the rich guy in town has his or her plot right next to the police station, you know, in the best part of town, while poorer people have their properties in areas that are much more exposed to armed groups, expropriation, and so on. So that could be it. When we look at the characteristics of loans, we see no change in average loan size, column one. We do see a small increase in the share of loans that are backed by the farmer's own collateral. And we see this interesting pattern where loans with maturity of three to five years decrease and are mostly uh, replaced by loans with a maturity of six or more years. What do we make of this? 
Well, the higher share of loans with own collateral could reflect improved property rights under that land restitution program that I told you about a while ago. So now after land restitution, farmers do have a title that allows them to go and use their, their own collateral. This in our model could, could mean lower application costs, of course. The change in loan maturity is a bit trickier because it could reflect projects with lower returns that were being foregone and are now being pursued, pursued say because they have a lower discounted present value. These could also be higher risk projects. So, <clears throat> and it is hard to tell. If, 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 if the change in maturity is telling us something about project returns or about project risk. However, we don't think that risk is central to the story because of the results in this table. So in this table, I'm showing you in column one, the average credit score of applicants, which is not changing. In column two, I'm showing you the share of audits that reveal irregularities using those audits that I told you about where they go and check whether you bought the tractor or not which is also not changing. And when we look at delinquency rates, and we do this in 15 different ways, we fail to find any evidence of change. Here is the, the, the event study for change for loans that are 60 days past due. And so I say that risk does not really seem to be a crucial part of the story, because if it was the case that conflict makes projects riskier or that riskier projects were being foregone due to conflict, we should see some action here and we don't. Now, to go back to some of my original motivation, here in this table, the dependent variable is again the loan application rate. And here I'm just showing you some heterogeneous effects, two that are of interest, or let me just point out one, which is the increase in the demand for credit is exclusively driven by areas that are near markets, near to the departmental capital, or near to Bogota. And so going back to my original question of whether conflict is the binding constraint on investment in these remote areas with poor access to markets, the answer seems to be no. Conflict does seem to matter at the margin in places that are better connected to the national economy, have better, play, have better access to places where to sell their products and so on. Now, in my last two minutes, I, we have tried looking at downstream effects. You may be interested in saying, well, uh, do crop yields change? Does agricultural output change? Does income change? There's not really good data with which to measure that. But here is some suggestive evidence uh, that we have on nighttime luminosity. This is using the more recent Beers data set for, for those of you that know about this stuff. What we see is that the you know, nighttime luminosity does increase in these FARC areas after the peace agreement. Now, we don't interpret this as saying that those investments and those loans are paying out straight away one month later. But to us, this is an indication of like a broader economic boom that is maybe increasing local demand for these products and is maybe what is driving people's increased willingness to invest. So we take this as suggestive evidence of like a broader positive economic effect of peace. So to wrap up. In this paper, we show that the end of conflict leads to a large increase in investment in these FARC affected municipalities, a roughly 17% increase in monthly credit disbursements. These new loans disproportionately correspond to producers with lower wealth and new clients. Uh, so in terms of financial inclusion, that is interesting. And these are also mostly long-term projects. And we see no change in default or misuse of funds. So we interpret this as a success story from the bank's perspective, insofar as they're able to accommodate this large demand shock without compromising you know, the, the quality of their loans. Overall, evidence suggests that producers forgo a sizable amount of profitable investments due to conflict. However, important caveat, conflict does not seem to be the binding constraint in those very remote, very disconnected uh, areas. Thank you. Great, uh, great paper. Let me see if questions. Uh, there was also a very active chat, um, but, but let me start with uh, Guzman. Okay, thank you. Uh, I placed a question in the chat room, but it was already answered. So that's 
uh, or at least partly under answered, so that's fine. So uh, I think there is a, there is a major thing that wasn't wasn't uh, discussed in at least in the presentation of the paper, uh, and it's it relates to illegal activities uh, in the regions where there is uh, FARC activities. So I understand that to some extent, missing investment in a is a relevant variable to measure uh, because it, it it relates to foregone foregone profits. But it's, it's also my understanding that terrorist uh, groups in Colombia work with uh, illegal activities like selling drugs. Uh, so assume that one is a farmer in Colombia and is looking to make a profit, and then you face two options. One is the legal activity for which you need a loan, a legal loan, and the other one is the illegal activity for which you probably don't need a loan, at least a legal loan. Uh, so if, if a farmer goes for the second one, then uh, FARC activities certainly push farmers towards illegal, the illegal option, but this this, in, this wouldn't create a, a foregone uh, profit. So I was wondering whether you can deal with this or... Yeah, that, that is a great question, Guzman. Thank you. And in the paper, uh, so one of our baseline controls that I skipped is precisely municipalities that had coca production in the pre-period. Uh, so, so that doesn't really seem to be driving things, but uh, we actually use data on coca, like satellite measurements of on coca crops to see coca as an output. And if anything, what we find, and that's in line with, with some of the findings of the literature on the Colombian peace process, what we find is that these FARC municipalities do experience a slight increase in coca cultivation. So it's not that these farmers are substituting from coca cultivation in conflict to other crops in peace. If anything, it's the power vacuum created by FARC dismantling is, is allowing the illegal economy to thrive a little bit. We do more checks in the paper, like uh, splitting the sample into high coca growth, low coca growth. It doesn't really seem to, to be driving uh, the effects. Uh, Nicolas, do you wanna add something? Feel free to chip in at any point. But yeah, thanks, that, thanks. that's a great point. Joe? Yeah, mine I was just following up with the coca stuff because it just seems to me like that's absolutely critical um, for a couple of reasons. One is obviously it's a source of income, like uh, Guzman was saying. It's also a source of conflict. A lot of the conflict measures you have are going to be more crime-related conflict. It's not necessarily political. Of course, it's tied in with the insurgent groups. And then the peace agreement itself is calls for people to move away from COCA and called for transfers uh, to, to people that um, had been COCA growers uh, to help move away. And uh, lastly, COCA is just not, it's, you don't need much money. You don't need much credit. It's a very quick crop to grow and, and it was very lucrative. So I guess, um, it's, I'm glad that you're controlling for the share, but I guess if you explain a little bit more about wh at what point in time, because it looks like it, it, you're only controlling it for an initial point in time. So what happens if you control for it more generally? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Joe, thank you. So it's true that our baseline analysis controls for municipalities that had coca cultivation before the start of our sample period. So this is telling us that it's not about that. But you're absolutely right along the lines of, of what Guzman pointed out and what you pointed out, that the peace process itself and FARC dismantling may be affecting the coca economy one way or another. And so in the paper, in our robustness checks, I can't remember if it's in the most recent draft that we put out, but we've certainly been putting a lot of work into that. We do things like measuring the places that experience the most coca growth or measuring coca growth during the sample period, during the peace process. And we do a bunch of different things like splitting the sample and seeing whether the effect varies between high and low, controlling for that growth, or even just taking, because you know, FARC is kind of bigger than the, than the coca economy. Even we can just take the municipalities that experience growth in coca and just kick them out of the sample. And so just focus on FARC municipalities that are kind of coca free, uh, if you wish. Now, that's not to say that, that nothing is going on. Like I mentioned, we do observe an increase in, in coca cultivation along the lines of the findings by Daniel Mejia and Juan Vargas and Munu Prem uh, on, on, on that. 
Uh, but you know, we we would tend to conclude that that's not what is what is mainly driving our results. So on that note, that I think again, uh, probably the the paper has more details, but but it would have been nice to get a more of a sense of how much these agriculture loans really mean in the country. So you just told us a uh, 2.7 loans and, and numbers like that, but relative to all loans in Colombia or even relative to agricultural loans, how, how much is that? Even the the number of the, the effect, it was like 14,000 PPP, but I, I don't know what that means. Relative to a minimum wage or relative to how much people were making in that area, that just some sense of, if these peanuts for the rest of Colombia and a lot of money for them or just a lot of money for everyone that I didn't get uh, a, a lot of sense. The, the other one is it would be nice to know what these 10 crops are and this may help us understand this result you were getting in maturity. Is it a quick crop or is coffee that takes at least five years to see some, some return? It, I, this will help us understand some of these effects. There is this table that you don't get anything to be significant, that a nice interpretation is there is nothing going on and not so nice interpretation is that there's a lot of measurement error in these measures. And so I, I didn't know what, what to do with that. And the other which one-, one is, Which one, sorry to interrupt, which one do you mean in that regard? It's, I think it's the second to last is you didn't number them, okay. but was, okay. I think sorry. the one on risk that nothing okay. was significant. Okay. And so, so I, I can see, a, yeah, there's no effect, but I can see it that, yeah, well, maybe the measures have a lot of measurement error. And, and the last is a little bit of generalization. So this is a very particular type of conflict. And I can think of perhaps some other countries that had similar conflict, similar terrain, similar circumstances. But how much can I generalize with another type of conflict that is perhaps more Basic and usual in most countries, which is urban crime, for example. Uh, so to, to answer some of your questions real quick, thank you for pointing out uh, the stuff on magnitude. We can definitely think on, on more revealing, illuminating ways to put it out there. My sense, Nicolas knows more about this than I do, is for these local economies and these local farmers, these are this is a sizable effect. But like I said, back caters to this market, to the segment of small producers. The big private banks cater to medium and large producers, to like agro-industrial companies and so on. So when you look at it relative to the whole pie of agricultural credit or to the whole pie of credit in Colombia, it will tend to be a relatively small effect. But when you think about it from the perspective of the local economy of these municipalities or from the even more micro perspective, of these small farms and these small businesses, we do think that, that it is uh, sizable. Now, regarding measurement error, I think you may have a point. Nicolas has some previous work showing that, you know, these credit scores, what they pick up and what they don't can be, can, can be not great. We, we tend to trust the measure on delinquency because either people pay their loan or they don't. And that is hard to, to, to falsify or, or to get wrong. And so to us, the most reassuring part of that table, of course, you could say, well, the audits, maybe there's some collusion and you're paying the auditor to say that everything looks great. Again, that could be, there could be some of that. Uh, but the delinquency rates to us is, is the harder proof that, you know, from the bank's perspective, whether people are becoming wealthier due to these loans, it's hard to tell. But at least from the bank's perspective, they're paying back. And so as some kind of prima facie evidence that these works, that these loans are, are put to good use, I would rely uh, on that. External validity, that's, that's a hard question. Uh, I think we should, we should think about that some more. I do think that our set that, you know, this, this type of, of rural conflict is prevalent in, in many settings, you know, Central America had, had a long history of these, no, Afghanistan sorry, and so on. No Costa Rica, no Costa Rica. No the Costa Rica, exactly, fair, uh, <clears throat> the, the exception to the rule. Uh, but, you know, when you think of, of a place like Afghanistan, uh, maybe there are some lessons to, to be drawn from this. Urban, I don't know, I, 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 I will postpone saying anything about that, but it's, I, we'll think about it. Unless, Nicolas, you have some thoughts. 
Oh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm still answering questions in the chat. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now stop for a 10 minute break. Thank you uh, to the authors, great papers, and to the participants, great discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much. Luis, one thing you may want to check is if they're not given a loan to pay a loan. Uh, we, that's, that's, uh, that's a... This is a political a government agency. There was a lot of interest for making this thing work. Uh, not only for marketing reasons, like if anyone who knows conflict, if you don't give them uh, something else to do, they'll go back uh, to fighting. So, yeah. so, so you may want to check, because you, from the numbers you showed, there did seem to be multiple loans to the same person, just out of, and so, so it might be evergreening. That's, that's a great point. And in that regard, one feature of our context that sets it apart a bit from the little I know about places like South Asia is that there's not a lot of like these private informal money lending. Uh, so it seems unlikely that say people had some type of loan with, with some money lender and that they're using the back loan uh, to no, pay it back. No, that, that is hard to believe. There are no sharks. I'm sorry, it's just hard to believe <laughs> there are no sharks in that area. <laughs> I don't know how you call them, but it's just hard to believe there is no alternative sources of money. <laughs> well, although, you know, from, from like the agricultural census and surveys, I will let, let me say it's not zero, but it's not as prevalent. It's not the main source of credit as it may be in, in, in other parts of the world. Now, one thing that we've been working on, and those results are almost ready, is we were able to connect uh, the loans to bank accounts. So since we have the individual ID, we were able to see, does this person that took out a loan, do they have a bank account at the same bank? And that is nice because most of the time, the loans are actually dispersed into, are put into the bank account. So we can actually draw these nice event studies where we can look at the balance of the bank account around the time that the loan is dispersed. And when Isn't that automatic? That should be automatic 99% of the time, unless someone for some reason said, give me a check. But yeah, so, so it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty automatic. But what is interesting is that in those results, what we find is that of course the balance shoots up dramatically when the loan arrives, but the balance starts to deplete very quickly. And approximately 10 months later, the balance is pretty much where it was before. Now, that does not answer your question about what they're using the money for. It does answer the question of, are they actually investing this money? Or is this some type of weird precautionary savings uh, type of thing? So the money does seem to be taken out of the account and used uh, for something. I, I will also take a break. <laughs> Okay, I'll see you in a little while. Thank, thank you very thank much. You Ciao. Diana, defending the, the land after 200 years of independence, people still bunches with the rest. I won't let them say that Costa Rica has anything that it doesn't. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Welcome everyone to the second session of the day. I would like to thank the organizers again for putting together such a wonderful program. And this is gonna be a little bit more of a trade session. The title is Domestic Export and Input Markets. Our first paper is the Special Production Networks by Costas, Federico and Yuhei. Federico is presenting. And what we were just saying is that uh, uh, Federico is also happy to take questions during the, during the talk. So you can either you know, interrupt him or use the chat like we did in the, previous, uh, in the previous session. All right, Federico, take it away. Thanks, thanks, Stefania. Thanks uh, for the organizers for having our paper in the program and thanks everyone for attending the talk. I posted the link to the paper and to the slides in the chat in case you wanna go through things during the talk. Um, but otherwise, I'll begin. Uh, so I'll talk about spatial production network, this joint work with Costas and Yuhei. Costas is, is somewhere there, so he can maybe answer and help with the chat discussion. Uh, and given my affiliation to the bank, the usual disclaimer applies. 
Okay, so the motivation for this paper is that the key feature of a modern economy is the, is the geographic complexity of the production networks. So these production networks are fragmented across countries, regions, and firms. And this has been sort of coined this idea of global value chains uh, and that, that has been shown to be important for countries and regions economic success as highlighted by the uh, uh, World Bank report in 2019. There, there have been two approaches to study these type of uh, uh, questions. Uh, one is the macro and the micro approach, and this has been recently surveyed um, by Johnson, Antrans, and, and Shore. Uh, on, on the one hand, you have the microeconomics determined by the production networks across countries and regions. And on the other hand, you have the microeconomics of how firms form endogenously production networks. However, there's limited understanding of how the macro and the micro approaches interact across regions and countries. So the goal of the paper is to study endogenous network formation in space and their aggregate implications. And in particular, how do production networks endogenously form across countries and regions, starting from uh, firm decisions? And second, how do networks endogenously respond to macro shocks and its aggregate and distributional effects? So more in detail, what we'll do is develop a micro-founded model of spatial production networks with tractable aggregation, firms search and match with suppliers and buyers in the geographic space, characterize, we characterize aggregate trade flows with gravity equations in the extensive and the intensive margin, and establish existence uniqueness, perform counterfactuals, and provide sufficient statistics for welfare. Then we go to the data, we apply the model to administrative firm-to-firm -firm transaction level data from Chile, we present stylist facts about spatial production networks, motivating the modeling choices. We calibrate uh, uh, the model to first observed intra and intra a uh, national trade, and second observed responses of production network to international trade shocks. And finally, we study the effects of two counterfactuals uh, shocks on domestic networks and welfare. The first is international trade shocks on global value chains, and the second is domestic transportation infrastructure. And we find the main finding is that there's a strong response of the domestic network, in particular, the extensive margin of the domestic network that has aggregate and distributional, relevant aggregate and distributional, distributional effects. So in terms of the literature, I, I already mentioned the macro and the micro approach of production network. This is obviously not an exhaustive list. Um, uh, third, we have this uh, endogenous production network in space. This is something relatively smaller literature, but growing in the recent years connected to Miyauchi and Panigrafi's uh, uh, job market papers. Uh, and then we have a, a connection with the micro-founded gravity trade models and sufficient statistics approach. So we'll map our model to those class of models very closely so that we can kind of speak to what differences our uh, framework provides to that uh, literature. And finally, there's obviously a large literature propagation of shocks in production networks. Uh, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but we're sort of providing more both evidence and also a tractable model to think about how these shocks propagate in the production network. Okay, so in the remainder of the talk, I'll, uh, I'll describe briefly the data uh, and start with some descriptive facts. Then I'll go to the model and general equilibrium analysis and, and I'll conclude with the quantitative analysis. Okay, so let's start first with the data. Um, so as I said, we'll use domestic firm-to-firm -firm transaction level data from Chile. This is collected by the Internal Revenue Service for value-added tax uh, collection purposes. It covers the universe of domestic trade between all firms in Chile, regardless of size. And for each transaction, uh, uh, we know the date, the, the ID of the seller and the buyer. We know the total sales, the product that they're trading, the prices, and most importantly for our case, the seller and buyer municipality. So that's gonna be the level of aggregation we work with, uh, there are around 345 municipalities in Chile. So that's sort of the space uh, uh, division that we'll have. And we take this data set, which is very novel in terms of the richness that it has, uh, to other more standard data sets. First, the customs data, which, which will give us information about imports and export activities of firms. This is sort of the usual customs data that you can find in other countries. Second, firm balance sheet characteristics that will give you sort of other tax information of these firms, such as total sales and the main industry of the firm. And finally, a matched employee-employee data set that gives us information about the labor market of these, of these firms. Okay, so let me show you first Chile. Um, um, you know, Chile is a very long country. You put it horizontally, it goes from San Francisco to York. If you put it diagonally, it goes from northernmost part of Norway to the southernmost part of Spain. We have the driest desert in the north and, the, and some amazing glaciers in the south. It's a very rich country in terms of geography. In terms of a population density, which is the map on the left, 
uh, you know, it's very concentrated around the center of the country. The three main cities are Santiago, Valparaíso, and Concepcion. But then, if you if you if you start showing things such as uh, I mean, related to the uh, production networks, such as the number of buyers per firm, you can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity throughout the country. So, you know, the number of buyers that a firm has on average in each municipality could go from 10 to around 200, and it's spread out in different places of the country. In particular, because it, it not only has to do with the density of, of population, but also the production capability of a set of, 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 of allocations. So I, I, I highlighted in the north, you have the mining industry, in the middle, you have the forest industry, and in the south, you have the fish industry. So here it's kind of suggesting that not, not only density might matter for linkages, but also uh, uh, the productivity that the firms have in those, in those places. So this sort of connects with the first fact that I want to mention which is that the number of domestic suppliers and buyers per firm is correlated with both firm's geographic location and firm size. And this is something we'll connect to the model because we're going to model the supplier buyer formation decision based on both the geographic location and productivity. So this is again connecting to the map that I was showing before, the density of allocation and matters, but also the productivity of the of, uh, of, 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 of what the firm is exposed to and, and, and sort of is, is heterogeneous on. And the second fact is that the number of supplier and buyer relationship between municipalities, that is the extensive margin, and the volume of transaction per relationship, that is the intensive margin, decay in geographic distance at different rates. And we'll connect that to the model because the model will imply a distinct gravity equation in the intensive and the extensive margin. And in particular, the extensive margin seems to be sort of have a higher decay rate with distance than the intensive margin. We'll connect that structurally with the model. And the final fact that, that I, will, I will go through in more detail is that the domestic firm network linkages increase with global import cost shock. So, so let me walk you through that. So we'll implement a firm level impact of import shocks using a shift shared design. This is taken off the shelf. We're not innovating here. We're gonna have outcomes and log changes at the firm year level. And we're gonna have the shift share. I'm gonna show you the import uh, side of the shift share that's gonna have the share, which is gonna be total imports relative to total input cost by firm I from country C, product K. Product K is gonna be six digit HS code uh, level. Uh, um, um, and this is gonna be defined before we look at the changes of the share, which is gonna be the second uh, uh, part of this of the shock that's going to measure log changes of world export supply of a country uh, uh, C of product K to the rest of the world without taking into account uh, Chile. And we're going to exploit 2009, 2007 differences, but we've looked at different uh, uh, time periods and, 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 and the results are robust. So these are the main results in this part. Uh, we find that the input shift share shock increases sales significantly. But most importantly for us, it increases also the production network of the firm, and in particular, the number of domestic suppliers that the firm has. Uh, uh, we also control for the export shift share shock, but we don't find sort of very strong results there. Uh, uh, and we add industry fixed effect six digits. We try it with more disaggregated industry fixed effect and, and the results go through. But the point here that we wanna make is that you know, this response of the production network and in particular, the number of linkages that firms have is an important feature of the data. And this is something that we'll include in the model that will feature also responses, endogenous responses of domestic production network to cost shocks. Federico, let me interrupt yeah. you just one second. There is a clarifying question from Alvaro. Sure. He's asking whether the yeah. municipality location is different for each plant that belong to a firm or whether you only have a quarters location. Great, yeah, no, this is a super important question. So. In the data, in the in the firm to firm data, we have uh, um, the origin destination of the plant that the transaction is involved with. Um, but at the end of the day, when we map this to the import cost shock and the export cost shock, we need to sort of collapse things at the at the firm level. But we do look at sort of heterogeneity of the response to uh, 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 the plant location where the trade is happening. Okay, uh, so let me go to the model. Um, so the setup is the following. Space uh, is partitioned by a finite number of locations. I will call them sometimes U for upstream or D for downstream. Uh, there's a continuum uh, of workers of measure LI in location I. 
um, that is exogenous. There are two types of goods, intermediate goods and final goods. Uh, the intermediate goods are traded across locations subject to ice per trade costs, and there's a single final good for each location that is not traded. There are two types of producers, final goods producers or intermediate goods producers that we'll call firms, and we'll focus our attentions on those. So in, on the production side, the unit cost of production by a firm Omega in location I will be a combination of the productivity of the firm, which is gonna be C, the wage, uh, uh, the local wage that the firm is, is hiring, I mean, it's using, that's gonna be W, that's gonna be aggregated uh, with a Cobb Douglas fashion with intermediate inputs, uh, uh, that's gonna involve the set of uh, suppliers that Omega has access to, which will endogenize by search and matching in the, in the next couple of slides. And then there's gonna be this price uh, V Omega, that's gonna be the price charged by supplier uh, V to a, a, a buyer Omega, and Sigma's elasticity of substitution of intermediate goods. There's a continuum of monopolistic suppliers with monopolistic competition, uh, so, so that the, the price is gonna be a constant markup, uh, markup over the marginal cost. And then the final goods producer will produce using all local intermediate inputs without search friction. So we're gonna make sort of the final good producers kind of uh, boring in some sense with elasticity of substitution, sigma under perfect competition. But we're thinking about expand, expanding this and kind of making it more sort of uh, rich and closer to what we're doing with intermediate goods producers. Okay, so the search and matching between firms uh, um, will imply that the production network links will be endogenous. Uh, firms will post advertisements for suppliers and buyers across locations to maximize anticipated profits, sort of following Costa's previous work and also a more recent work uh, uh, on production networks in Turkey by Demir, Felix, Su, and Yang. Um, and then there will be an aggregate random matching uh, 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 function for each pair of locations a la uh, DMP. So the firm decisions on that dimension, firms will be choosing uh, the number of ads for both suppliers and buyers that they'll be posting for each pair of locations. They'll get some profits from that. Uh, uh, that's gonna be a function of the number of ads that they put, but also the matching rate with buyers. That's gonna uh, 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 tell you the likelihood that they're gonna actually get linkages for, from the posts. Uh, and that's gonna be an endogenous object. I'm gonna explain a little how, how we get there. Uh, there's gonna be a search cost that's gonna have this EI, that's gonna be the unit price of the advertisement services. And you can see that EI here is a, is a Cobb Douglas combination of, of wages and intermediate costs with a, with a Cobb Douglas parameter move that's going to be different from the Cobb Douglas parameter that I showed you before that goes into production. This is actually going to be very important. This is something that we're going to estimate that's going to tell us a bit how the response is sort of a, a function also of endogenous a, a, a general equilibrium objects such as the prices and the intermediate input costs. And then we have exogenous parameters for the search cost. There's a, a fixed cost, -ish, I mean, there's a cost shifter F, B and FS, and then there's gonna be a gamma B and gamma S that's gonna govern the curvature of the search cost relative to the number of ads the firms post. So you can get a solution from this. So you can see here, here the number of ads that the firm posts should be a function of Z. It's gonna be equal to a shifter that's gonna be location pair specific, A, a and then productivity. And this sort of connects back to fact one that we're highlighting that you know, the number of links that firms have is a function of not only productivity, which is something that has been shown in the literature, in the literature before, but also these shifters that are a function of geographic characteristics. So both geography and productivity matters for the number of posts that firms have, and therefore also the number of links that firms have. So given that, we go to the aggregate matching, the total number of supplier to buyer relationships is gonna be determined by this matching function. So you're gonna have the total number of, of supplier posting and buyer posting in a particular location pair uh, that's gonna be aggregated with this Cobb Douglas where the Cobb Douglas weights are gonna be lambda a, a S and lambda B. They don't have to sum up to one. There could be increasing returns here. And there's gonna be this Kappa UD, which is gonna be the shifter uh, uh, at the location pair level of the, of the, of the matching uh, that they have. And then the total number of relationships and average transaction volume given this matching function from U to D it's gonna be equal to the following. So you can decompose the extensive and the intensive margin as is sort of usual. You can decompose it into a bilateral component and an origin and destination component. So the origin and destination component is kind of a, a standard in the sense that the origin, sort of the upstream component captures a, a cost characteristics sort of supply characteristics and the downstream component captures demand characteristics. But what's interesting for us is that the bilateral component in the extensive margin 
is a function of the matching shifter. It's a function also of the cost shifter for having ads, both suppliers and buyers. And it's also a function of the, of the iceberg trade cost. Whereas the intensive margin bilateral component is only a function of, of um, uh, the iceberg trade cost. So you can already see here that uh, uh, there's a different spatial structure for the extensive and the intensive margin that is predicted by the model, with, which connects back to the fact too that I was mentioning before. And going back to Alvaro's uh, uh, question before about the location, uh, uh, um, information that we have of firms, both fact two and, and fact one, when we're connecting uh, uh, firms to to geographic characteristic, we're using the most narrowly defined version of the data that has information from the plant origin and destination of the transactions that they have with each other. So, so here we're sort of leveraging really the richness of the data and kind of using the plant information that it's really important to, to, our, to our case. Okay, so let me go to the general equilibrium um, um, analysis. Uh, we can characterize the equilibrium by reducing it to a two times n system on wages and intermediate uh, uh, cost. Uh, uh, the wages are going to be pinned down by this buyer axis equation that tells you how much uh, buyers uh, at a given location can obtain. This sort of uh, uh, trade flows is going to be a function of the full vector of wages, the full vector intermediate cost, and also the shifters that I was mentioning partly because there's a network here, so all locations are connected with each other, but also because of the matching process, right? That's gonna create also relationships across uh, uh, regions. And then you get the supplier axis, which is gonna define the solution for the cost shifter, which is gonna tell you how much suppliers can affect the costs of a particular region. And again, these trade flows uh, uh, that affect the cost of a particular region are gonna be a function, again, of all the endogenous objects in, in other regions. So, so this is similar to previous literature in terms of the supplier and buyer access, but we'll incorporate here and make it in a tractable way the endogenous search and matching. Okay, and then we can sort of rewrite these two equations that's gonna yield the, these two expressions that we have here. But what's important here are two things. First is you can show that this is only gonna be a function of the two endogenous objects. These a, a, a K shifters are gonna be a combination of exogenous parameters, including the shifters that I talked about before and uh, uh, some parameters, and in particular, let me highlight uh, lambda tilde S and lambda tilde B. These are gonna be equal to lambda, which is you know, the, 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 the Cobb-Douglas matching parameter over gamma, which is the, uh, 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 the curvature of the, of the cost, of the search cost effort. Uh, and that's gonna be sort of a sufficient uh, parameter to understand sort of how the endogeneity of the network matter for the solution. Um, um, and not and not these parameters separate. So 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 it's lambda over gamma gamma that matters. And given this, we can show that this solution spans canonical gravity trade models with roundabout production. That would be a case, a special case of our model in which lambda tilde is equal to zero for both buyers and suppliers, but not vice versa. You cannot generate the equilibrium solution of these other canonical uh, gravity trade models. Um, 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 that we generate with our model. So in that sense, yeah, uh, they're not isomorphic to our model. Uh, we also provide sufficient conditions for equilibrium and existence, uh, equilibrium existence and uniqueness following Costa's previous work and characterize contrafactual equilibrium a la DEK with using only bilateral trade flows between locations and uh, 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 the parameters that I show there. Finally, we can provide sufficient statistics for welfare. So uh, uh, we can show that uh, uh, changes of welfare are proportional uh, 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 to changes in own trade uh, uh, shares, which is the usual uh, measure in, 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 in the trade literature, but also the number of linkages within a location. So this is something that our model adds. In the case in which you go back to the canonical trade models in which lambda tilde is equal to zero, then M tilde is gonna be equal to one. The changes in the endogenous uh, linkages is, is, is equal to one. And then you go back to gravity trade models uh, and sort of the predictions of ACR would hold here. And M I hat is gonna capture changes in productivity through endogenous search and matching. So here, you know, M, M hat is gonna change because this A shifter is gonna change potentially, but also the matching rate might change. And that's gonna sort of affect the welfare that we predict in our model. And this is something we're gonna get, take to the counterfactuals and see how relevant this additional component is. So let me go there. Um, 
We're going to calibrate the model with 355 municipalities. Those are the ones that we have in Chile. We're going to add uh, uh, the rest of the world, but also focus on China, the US, and Germany. Uh, we'll exactly match the bilateral trade flow, so we can just invert the model and sort of match this directly to the, to the model. Uh, uh, we'll use the domestic firm-to-firm -firm transaction data, but also the customs data that gives us the relationship between trade in the rest of the world with the specific locations within Chile. Uh, beta is going to be equal to zero two. We calibrate that to the labor share out of total input expenditures that we measure in the data. And then sigma, mu, lambda tilde S and lambda tilde B will be uh, um, um, estimated with an indirect inference process that's going to target the responses of the input shock as, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as I showed in fact three. We're going to impose that lambda tilde B is going to be equal to lambda tilde S. I'm going to impose also the sufficient uh, conditions for equilibrium um, uh, uniqueness. Uh, I want to mention that we obtain a mu to be equal to 0 0.7, so significantly larger relevance of labor in search costs rather than labor in production. And this is something that sort of is, is, a, is, is a solution given the response that we see of the import shocks. Uh, and second, we find sigma to be equal to three. So kind of a, a, a value that is in the range of, of, of what's found in the literature, maybe closer to the sort of macro literature if you want. Um, and then lambda tilde is equal to 0 0.19. We, we implement a spatial friction decomposition. I'm, gonna, in, I'm not gonna go through in detail given uh, time, but uh, we can decompose bilateral trade frictions into the search and matching frictions and iceberg cost following the equations that I showed you before uh, uh, on, the, on, on the gravity equation. And we find that the search and matching frictions is much more sensitive to geographic distance than iceberg costs. Okay, but let me go to the counterfactual simulations. Um, we're gonna do these two counterfactuals that I mentioned. First is the effects of shocks on global value chains connected to Chile. And second is domestic in, uh, transportation infrastructure, in particular, the effects of uh, uh, building a mega bridge uh, 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 with the uh, island of Chiloé. Uh, and we're going to explore two scenarios for the counterfactuals. First is the baseline scenario when we have the, the estimated uh, lambda tilde. And the second is a scenario in which there's no endogenous response in the extensive margin. So these lambda tildes are equal to zero. So in the first uh, uh, counterfactual, we consider a 10% reduction of iceberg trade costs for the baseline model. That's going to imply that the bilateral shifter is going to be equal to an increase of 35%. Uh, uh, for both, we're going to try this with China, Germany, and the US, and we're going to apply the same shock for the no extensive margin case, so the case where lambda tilde is equal to zero. So the, the welfare average welfare gains are here, so we, we show here the average welfare gains uh, weighted by population across, across regions. So you can see that in the baseline equilibrium, there's an increase in welfare of 3.6% with trade with China, with Germany 0 0.4, and with the US is 2.5. In the case with no extensive margin, the welfare gains are significantly smaller. So if you ignore the endogenous extensive margin response, you would substantially underestimate the welfare gains from these shocks. You might think that maybe the China shock is very large here, but it turns out that trade with China for Chile is super important. If you take both export and import, trade with China accounts for around 15% of, of GDP and around 50% of total trade. Uh, so, so, so it's very important and sort of makes sense that these numbers are large. But what's important for us is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of distributional effects um, um, across regions. So here I'm plotting on the x-axis, the direct international trade exposure that each region has with say China on the left-hand side. And there you can see that there's a positive correlation between the exposure and the welfare gains, which is the y-axis. So you can see that the welfare gains can go as little as 2% to around 12%. And, 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 and the size of the, of the balls are, are, are the magnitude, the population size of, the, of, of each location. But what's important is that if, if you go from the baseline to the no extensive margin case, so from blue to green, you can see that sort of a shift down that sort of suggests that in the, no ex, in, in the baseline model, there's a, a, a indirect effect on regions that are not directly exposed. And you can see that, you know, that the intercept, uh, uh, you know, at zero exposure is significantly higher for um, the baseline model. So it tells you that the indirect effects are kind of important there in terms of positive welfare effects of the shock on regions that have no direct exposure to international trade. 
Okay, let me finish briefly with the transportation infrastructure um, uh, contrafactual. So but there's this, five um, minutes. Yeah, thanks. This is a mega bridge that's planned to open in 2025, although maybe with the pandemic, it's gonna be a couple of years later. It's, 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 it will become the largest suspension bridge in South America when it's finished. It will shoulder, shorten tra travel time to the main line from around 35 minutes, which is currently by ferry, to around two minutes. It, and will simulate the reduction of bilateral trade course cost proportional to travel time uh, um, a reduction. We're going to use the travel time elasticities of trade and search costs from the cross-sectional in the data. So we're going to take these estimates of travel time. We're going to project them on the on the on this on this search and um, um, uh, matching and also trade costs. And we're going to predict with that how are the gains in terms of reduction in these costs, and then project that into the model and see what we gain in terms of welfare. So the average welfare gains again population weighted uh, averages is, is 0.84. Um, um, in the baseline model, if you ignore the extensive margin, you go down to around 0.5% uh, increase in welfare. So the, you know, again, if you ignore the extensive margin, the endogenous extensive margin, you substantially underestimate the welfare gains. And we also find substantial heterogeneous effects uh, with respect to trade with the island uh, Chiloé that I'm not gonna talk about in the interest of time. Okay, so let me, let me conclude. So we provide a tractable micro-founded model of production networks in space. Uh, we establish existence and uniqueness, uh, perform counterfactuals and provide sufficient uh, statistics for welfare. We apply our model to firms domestic and foreign transactions data from Chile. Uh, we present stylist facts about spatial production networks that are consistent with the model. And, and we find in the counterfactuals a strong response of the domestic network, which affects aggregate and also distributional um, 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 implications across Chile. Uh, we focus on the domestic sort of propagation and effects uh, here, but the framework can be easily extended to think about cross-country production network, propagation of shocks, and how endogenously a uh, uh, production network uh, uh, um, uh, responds. And, and, and let me finally say that we're working currently on three things. One is extending the model to add a sectoral uh, uh, sort of trade uh, uh, so that we can have sort of heterogeneity in terms of how these linkages respond and are created in different sectors. Second, we're, we're working through a decomposition of the welfare effects into different components, such as technological or reallocation components, sort of following Bakay and Fadi's work. And finally, we're extending the empirical sort of reduced form analysis to understand how these shocks that we, that we were showing propagate uh, 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 geographically across different locations, depending on how much they are related to other locations through domestic trade. So let me finish there. Thanks a lot for your time and listening. Thank you. Thank you, Federico, for a great presentation. This is a hard paper to present in half an hour. So there was an active discussion in the chat. I think Costas answered everything, uh, but let me just summarize. I think uh, both angles of the discussion were centered around the relationship between the model and the data and how the two things uh, tie together. Uh, Steve had a point uh, about uh, your continuum assumption, which is my understanding buys a lot of the uh, aggregation properties of the model and contrasting it with the fact that in the data and reality, the supplier buyer uh, uh, matrix of relationship uh, uh, is definitely more sparse than, than a continuum. Um, pointing out how, of course, the continuum assumption is, is key for tractability, but it does rule out a lot of other considerations that could be related to potentially market power of, of buyers and suppliers. And this is something I was also thinking about myself, and I was curious. I know that you guys cannot uh, really extend the model in the same way, considering market power considerations in this network, but if you have any intuition, at least of how your results can qualitatively change. Um, and then Meredith had uh, also a point about uh, disentangling really what are the kinds of frictions uh, that uh, are driving these networks. And uh, clearly your setup puts a lot of emphasis on search and matching, uh, but her point, if I understand correctly, was that um, there may be other things. And of course it's a model, so <laughs> we cannot have everything, uh, but whether you have a sense of uh, uh, whether there could be other drivers that, of course, you're not uh, taking into consideration in these papers, but that uh, they could be important. And I, as I said, uh, um, Costas already addressed uh, most of this, but I don't know if either of you has anything to add. I think this is a good time. Otherwise, we can just uh, open up for other questions if there are any. 
Yeah, I can I can respond briefly to I mean uh, it's Acosta's responses, but I can I I can also add a couple of things. I think yeah, pushing pushing the framework and, and sort of this agenda to a setup with variable markups uh, and with sort of bilateral uh, uh, firm to firm uh, market power, so go to, sort of going in both directions. I think it's super exciting, and there's some recent work trying to do this. Uh, um, and I think we have the data in Chile to do this and kind of look at it very in, in detail. Uh, it's just a, a, a little bit sort of beyond of what of what the paper is already doing because we're already sort of uh, putting a lot of stuff in there. But but I think it's a, it's definitely something interesting going forward. On same thing on sparsity. I mean, it's completely true that. Uh, the number of locations that a firm match with is like a 10% of the total number of locations that uh, uh, there are available. So there's definitely a lot of sparsity there. And um, I think that once we add sort of the, the industry part uh, uh, on the model, that's going to help us in kind of uh, uh, looking at heterogeneity in terms of the number of, of, of connections firms have across regions, but obviously we'll never get to the sparsity that that steve is pushing and i think that's definitely something interesting going forward on the frictions yeah i mean here we don't have like direct evidence evidence to kind of say which friction is more relevant than other friction we're sort of just using a a, 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 a an, an instrument that sort of works well theoretically in terms of aggregation and, and, and it's tractable but i think yeah it's super interesting to think more in detail about which other friction might be driving and kind of disentangling whether search and matching friction matters more than other types of frictions. And Meredith has some great work there. So that would be kind of very exciting to think more about how we can do that better maybe going forward, but probably potentially in a second, in, in, a, in a different paper. Um, so I see that Meredith has a follow up question. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, I, I think. Um, you know, if there's a suggestion here, it was almost kind of in the opposite direction of what you were saying, Federico. It's like this doesn't seem like the kind of setting, as you say, that's optimal for, you know, distinguishing exactly which friction it is. And so my thinking was instead, it seems like there may be sort of a whole category of frictions that if kind of they follow costs of this form, generate the patterns you see. And it seems like almost a more useful direction for this paper might just be to describe like what is that class of frictions or mechanisms that yield the same things. Or, or maybe that will lead you to the conclusion that actually there are some that we can kind of rule out because there's a slightly different prediction. But it seemed a lot of things that sort of like any, any cost of establishing or maintaining a relationship or a fixed cost of trade or transport related to distance, it, at least my initial intuition was, might generate these same patterns. And so it'd be really interesting to know whether it's actually that broad or whether there's some kind of more nuanced um, detail there. Yeah, no, no, that's a great suggestion. And, uh, and I wasn't implying that we should add more types of frictions already in this paper. It was just thinking for future work. Um, but yeah, this is a great, this is a great suggestion. We can definitely explore that. Uh, but I'm just kind of glad to this Meredith, um, I mean, they have to match, to map all these explanations, have to map to something like matching and searching frictions, right? Because in the end, we use the bilateral ma um, relationship in the data to estimate them. So in that sense, uh, not any free, not any trade cause that relates to extensive margin would do it, I think. Uh, we're happy to entertain ideas. All right. So, uh, does people have any other questions, comments? Um, we do have five more minutes on this paper. If there is anything else you want to talk about. I did, since nobody's talking, I'll ask a dumb question maybe, but, but what's the, the welfare stuff? Um, what's the relationship between that and sort of like the ACRC uh, formula? And I'll just leave it open at that. Yeah, so so the ACRE, I mean, yeah, the ACRF, our, our format would be closer to the no extensive margin case, as I was mentioning before, if you shut down 
the endogenous response of the of the of the network, you would get the formula that I showed you before. I mean, the standard ICR formula in the case with intermediate inputs. It wouldn't be exactly this because obviously here we're kind of taking into account, um, um, you know, a, a model without this. I mean, there's two different things. One is sort of taking the baseline and just ignore the endogenous response of the of the linkages that will give you one number, and and this number we're not showing here. But what we're showing is that if you go to a standard model that cannot a canonical trade model where AC or formula holds, you would get this uh, a no extensive uh, row um, response in terms of welfare. No, but I guess do you does that show up in terms of the needing to recalibrate the trade elasticity or do you know? Yeah, we we don't yeah yeah we don't recalibrate the trade elasticity in the in the no extensive margin case. So this is sort of holding the setup of the parameter estimates because we sort of think that the so if you, the if, you that we use, the, if you observed the world with two different model with the two different models, would you get similar welfare? Um, yeah, yeah. So you're saying recalibrating the model with without the extensive margin to see whether the sigma would be very different, uh, for example. Yeah, is that? I'm just trying to. See yeah, yeah. I'm, no, no, no. We're not doing that here. Okay. We're not recalibrating the model in the no extensive margin. The only thing we're doing is that we're setting lambda tilde to be equal to zero. Oh, yeah, so but we're not recalibrating the other okay. parameters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think the calibration of the trail elasticity might be similar here because the coefficient of gravity are similar. What's different is the frictions you back out when you do this, uh, like the change in the frictions. That, uh... Okay. Um, okay, so I, I think we can slowly transition to the next paper. I know that there are still some conversations going on in the chat, but I'll leave it to you guys to, um, you know, settle those. Um, so maybe Brian, you can uh, start sharing your slides. Okay. Thank Wonderful. you. Matt. And uh, are you okay with being interrupted along the way, same way? Uh, we did for Federico a little bit if there are explanatory questions, so would you rather have everything for the end? Um, I think maybe everything for the end, since both uh, Nina and Wen Fong are available to answer uh, quick clarifying questions in the chat, if that's okay. Wonderful. All right. So our next paper is FDI Inflows and Domestic Firms, Adjustments to New Export Opportunities by Brian, Nina, and Wen Fong. Take it away. All right, great, thank you very much. Just like to first uh, thank all the, the STEG uh, program leaders and as well the, uh, the conference organizers for the opportunity to present here today. So as I mentioned, uh, both Nina and, uh, and Wen Fong are available in the chat, so please feel free to make extensive use of that uh, and they can answer any things that I misspoke about. So the overall background here is that we're interested in the fact over the last you know, 20 to, um, to 30 years, there's been a dramatic increase in foreign direct investment into developing countries. Um, in fact, um, this is a particularly true, um, uh, you know, just most recently as developing countries have now started to become the recipient of more than half of foreign direct investment around the world. And this is primarily flowing into greenfield investment. So this is, we believe that this potentially has implications for technology transfer, productivity, uh, job creation, et cetera. And so these large um, FDI inflows then has led to growing interest in trying to understand patterns around entry and growth of foreign affiliates in developing countries. Um, and thus far, at least our reading of the literature, I mean, there's some people in the audience that can, can help us here for missing some things, is it seems like most of the empirical research on foreign affiliates focuses on one source country, right? So you might be thinking about multinationals that are based in the US or they're based in France. And then looking at their decisions in terms of you know, what host countries to then open foreign affiliates in. Here in this paper, we're going to sort of reverse it and instead look at one host country that is potentially receiving foreign affiliates um, from uh, numerous source countries. We believe that more evidence is needed for trying to understand how trade policy interacts with foreign direct investment um, and also other types of firms. Um, you know, this is partly because there's an ongoing debate about just how responsive value-added trade or fragmented production networks are to changes in trade policy through trade agreements. And additionally, in the presence of misallocation, which can be quite pervasive in some developing countries, there's no consensus on how trade reforms are likely to affect um, market reallocation and overall productivity in response to changes in trade policy. Oops. 
So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to affect, uh, examine the effects of lower tariffs on exports, in this case due to the 2001 USB on um, bilateral trade agreement, to see how it affects firm entry, exit, and employment in Vietnam. The trade agreement is really quite uh, nice from an evaluation perspective because it's really quite one-sided. It represents a large positive export demand shock for firms that are based in Vietnam as the main policy change is a sudden and immediate drop in U.S. tariffs on exports from Vietnam. This happens in 2001, and this figure that we show the, the bottom half of the slide shows the growth in manufacturing exports from Vietnam to the United States that you know, really is flat from 1996 up to 2001, and this very rapidly grows thereafter. So the first contribution that we're gonna to try to make in this paper is in the, the background of overall very rapid structural change that's happening in Vietnam, in particular highlighted by tremendous growth of formal manufacturing employment. It grew over fourfold between 2000 and 2017. We're gonna examine the role of foreign affiliates and what role they might play in this overall aggregate growth in particular responding to the trade agreement and do so in the context of a country that has a large state sector, which might mean that um, politically unconnected firms may be more constrained, for example, in terms of accessing credit. Okay. In our data, one of the strengths is that we observe firms, um, all types, so this by this we mean uh, foreign affiliates, state-owned enterprises in Vietnam, much like in China, and as well as private domestic firms. And if we focus, for example, just on exporters, we'd only be capturing up to about 70% of revenue and employment in, in formal manufacturing. And here we're able to see firms of all sizes. There is no firm size cutoff or minimum revenue in order to be um, showing up in our data set. It covers all formally registered firms in Vietnam. And in a few slides, I'll get into a little bit more detail about who exactly is formally registered in Vietnam. Our second contribution and a point that we'll come back to sort of repeatedly through the presentation is potentially the importance of being able to study changes in trade policy and firm behavior over a very long time period, right? So this is just in response to a one-time trade policy shock. And we have data that's going to allow us to observe firms from 2000 up to 2017, as well as some uh, more aggregate data, not at the firm level, but at the industry level for a few years leading up to the trade agreement. This long time period is potentially important due to delayed adjustment of capital as documented in other recent work. Um, but as we're gonna show in this paper, it's also potentially important for understanding and examining um, growth within firms after they first enter in Vietnam, okay. particularly for foreign invested firms. The third contribution that we're going to be able to do in this paper is using our, our data, being able to track firms over time, is we're going to be able to decompose shifts in employment in response to, to the trading policy between continuing firms, new entrants, um, and, uh, and exiters okay. by firm ownership. This, is gonna, this happens during a period of very large foreign affiliates um, and domestic private firm entry. So for example, the beginning of time period with the firm data in 2000, foreign firms accounted for about 22% of employment in formal manufacturing, and this grew to uh, almost 60% by 2017. This coincided with a period of relatively uh, you know, large decline in the role of state-owned firms, not only as a share, but also an absolute level. They declined from 45% of employment down to only 3%, while well, domestic private firms grew from about 33 to 39. There's a large related literature that, you know, I think our paper speaks to in different ways. Um, I'm not gonna go into any details here just due to time constraints, but I just wanna highlight a few key points before I move on. First of all, you know, there is a large literature about foreign direct investment in developing countries. Most of this literature is focused on whether there's, you know, productivity spillovers, for example, to domestic firms. More recently, um, some work uh, you know, by members here in the audience, for example, has highlighted the potential um, influence of foreign firms in terms of reallocation and competition within the domestic market. This literature also highlights the FDI entry or acquisition decisions. In our case, it's gonna be mostly entry. There's, there's really not many mergers and acquisitions happening in our context, but this is an endogenous decision that might be influenced by financial constraints. Um, third, there's a, a Growing literature about FDI entry and how it interacts potentially with um, changes in policy, particularly um, trade policy. So, for example, looking at bilateral tax treaties um, and how FDI entry responds to changes in tariffs and trade policy, and also how it's endogenous to the formation of global supply chains. Um, so, for the remainder of my talk today, I'm going to spend a couple of slides going over the background of the bilateral trade agreement, trying to convince you that this is a really useful. Um, experiment to, to try to examine causal effects. We'll briefly talk about um, conceptually what one might expect in this context before getting into our empirical results that will do some 
we'll quickly look at changes um, in relative industry size before we then focus on uh, within industry reallocation. And then lastly, focusing on the, um, decomposing um, the foreign uh, entry margin into initial entry versus subsequent growth. So the bilateral trade agreement um, follows the end of the U.S. trade embargo on Vietnam in 1994, right? So following the U.S.-Vietnam War, there's an embargo that stays in place until 1994. After the embargo is listed, uh, sorry, is lifted, Vietnamese exports to the U.S. though still face putatively high tariffs as they were subject to column two of the U.S. tariff schedule. Okay. One of the really nice features of this trade agreement is that when the agreement comes into effect in late 2001, there's an immediate shift from column two to most favored nation status, right? So this is part of the overall normalization of political and economic relations between Vietnam and the United States. So this means that the tariff cuts here resulted from switching from one pre-existing tariff schedule to another. A second nice feature of this trade agreement is from the Vietnamese side, Vietnam was already offering MFN access to imports from the United States. So this really is a quite one-sided trade agreement with a shift from column two to MFN for Vietnamese exports from uh, to the US. Another key feature of the data is that these tariff reductions, I mean, they're, they're really quite large and they do vary across manufacturing industries. So they're about a 29 percentage point reduction on average from 32% down to 3%. Um, and on the graph, the figure that we show on the, the slide, what we've done is we've taken our firm level data, aggregated it up to the two digit industry level, and then plotted from left to right along the horizontal axis, industries based on their in, um, size of employment in 2000 with the largest industries such as footwear on the left and the smallest industries such as tobacco and machinery on the right. It's quite clear that there's significant variation both among uh, industries that had initially large employment as well as industries that had initially small employment. So there's no strong correlation between initial employment patterns and the subsequent tariff reductions received by Vietnamese industries. From an evaluation point of view, one of the really nice features here, as I mentioned, is this shifting from one pre-existing tariff schedule to another, right? And so this means that the, you know, because of this, the two pre-existing tariff schedules, there's really not room for either Vietnamese industries or U.S. industries to lobby, right? For, um, for you know, either less market access if you're U.S. firms or more market access from the Vietnamese side. Both of these tariff schedules were in place long before the trade agreement between US and Vietnam, right? The column two tariff schedule is largely unchanged um, dating all the way back to the Tariff Act from 1930. The MFN schedule was negotiated among WTO members in 1985 and Vietnam was not a member of the WTO during that time period, doesn't join until 2007. In previous work, Nina and I have shown that these tariff cuts, they're uncorrelated with contemporaries, export demand shocks, supply shocks, or pre-existing trends in exports. And in our current work, we go a little bit further looking at uh, potential correlations with, pre uh, with initial conditions and find uh, you know, pretty consistently no evidence of any strong correlations, uh, for example, with initial ownership shares in particular industries. Importantly, given our focus on FDI, um, I don't have time to go into the details here, but there's no industry specific policies that affect FDI as part of this trade agreement. In fact, Vietnam was already very open to foreign direct investment within manufacturing prior to the BTA. We go. So I'll just briefly talk conceptually about what one might expect from this trade agreement, right? If we think about a standard Mellets framework, right, we would expect that the reduction in the variable export costs should lead to expansion of the most productive incumbent firms within Vietnam. At the same time, the contraction and or exit of the least productive firms, right? So this channel should lead to within industry shifts, both due to selection and reallocation. But the picture gets a little bit more complicated in terms of conceptually what one might expect when one considers that these lower export costs also make Vietnam more attractive for multinationals to use it as an export platform to not only export to the US, but also potentially to other markets. Additionally, the picture becomes a little bit cloudier still when you consider that there's a relatively large presence of state-owned enterprises in Vietnam at the beginning of our trade agreement. And this may lead to um, you know, greater misallocation, which may hinder the reallocation of resources towards the more productive firms. So ultimately we sort of, you know, ex ante, we think that this is an empirical question to try to think about how the trade agreement is gonna to lead to reallocation of resources between domestic firms, whether they're state or private and potential uh, foreign affiliates. 
And indeed, we do some preliminary evidence that foreign firms, uh, you know, do look different from the domestic firms, right? They're more likely to report um, that international markets are their main markets. So that's a figure on the left. But 56% of foreign firms, and this is data coming from the World Bank Enterprise Service, report that a international market is their main market, as compared to only 24% for state-owned firms and 21% for private firms. Another way that these firms may differ is that foreign-owned firms are less likely to, to report that financing is an obstacle, right? 65% of foreign firms say that access to finance is not, op is not an obstacle, as compared to about 29% for state-owned firms and about 39% uh, for private firms. Okay. The data that we're going to be using comes from the annual enterprise census conducted by the General Statistics Office in Vietnam. It stretches or it starts in 2000 and we have it to 2017 in the current draft. The data covers all state and foreign firms as they must be legally registered um, as an enterprise in order to operate in Vietnam. For domestic private firms, you must legally register as an enterprise if you have more than 10 workers or you want to um, operate in more than one location. However, we do see many private firms with less than 10 workers also you know, endogenously choosing to register as an enterprise. So we see all formally registered enterprises, right? So just to be clear, we do not see informal firms here. Um, Nina and I have worked on that uh, in previous work. We're able to follow firms over time. So we can you know, look at uh, new firm entry. We can observe firms that are exiting as well as tracking performance changes among continuers. We're gonna broadly group our firms into those that are state-owned that includes 100% state-owned as well as those with more than 50% state capital. Foreign invested enterprises, this is almost exclusively, um, particularly by the end of our time period, those that are wholly foreign owned, but there are some joint ventures with both state and private firms. And then also uh, our third category will be private domestic firms. Okay. To be clear here about what exactly is the unit of analysis, for foreign and private firms, um, it's an establishment. So for example, Samsung appears multiple times in our data corresponding to different plant locations that they have in Vietnam. Conversely though, for state-owned firms, many times what we see there is multiple locations, multiple establishments that share one tax code and thus are one firm in our, one observation in our data set. So in terms of the foreign and the private firms, you should really be thinking about them as an establishment, like a plant location observation, whereas for the state-owned enterprises, it's a firm where there might be potentially dozens of um, subsidiaries or branches that are part of that firm. Okay. Just to provide a few quick summary statistics about entry and exit to, you know, at the aggregate level document that this is an important margin of adjustment during a time period between 2000 and 2017. So here we're looking at the cumulative entry and exit between 2000 and 2017. Uh, among state-owned firms, almost half of them that were operating in 2000, 49%, had exited by 2017, and they corresponded to almost 40% of state employment. Among state firms operating in 2017, over a quarter of them are brand new relative to, to 2000, their entrance, um, and they, again, account for a sizable chunk of state employment. But entry and exit is, is much greater uh, among our foreign and, uh, well, definitely entry is definitely much greater among foreign firms. A staggering 93% of foreign firms that are operating in Vietnam by 2017 entered after 2000, okay? and they account for 87% of employment in foreign, foreign firms in 2017. We see very high rates at both entry and exit among domestic private firms. 98%, right? almost all the private domestic firms that are operating in 2017 have entered post-2000. Um, and we've seen a lot of exit of the private domestic firms that were operating in 2000, 84% of them have exited by 2017. So at an aggregate level, there's lots of entry and exit that's happening. And one of the things we're gonna be doing is trying to see if this is linked um, in any important way to the trade agreement. So to do our analysis, we're gonna start with an industry level analysis where we're gonna take the change in the, uh, in the tariffs going from column two to MFN. So just to, to be clear here, this is gonna be the column two rate minus the MFN. So it's gonna be a positive tariff change as associated with an increase in market access. We're going to interact that with a series of, oops, sorry, the interactions here. We're gonna interact that with a series of year indicators, right? So we're gonna be able to essentially map out the timing of the response using 2001 as the omitted year as our baseline year. We're gonna include industry fixed effects, time fixed effects, as well as a vector of um, industry varying controls. These are meant to help capture other things that are happening that might be correlated with the trade agreement, such as changes in US quotas that are applied to Vietnam and uh, for textiles and clothing exports. Similarly, US quotas that are applied to clothing and textile exports from China as a main competitor in these industries 
in the US market, and then also controlling for changes in Vietnam's MFN tariffs during this time period. So really what we're going to be interested in is sort of mapping out this timeline uh, for the various beta T's to see how the response of the BTA evolves over time. So before we get into the firm level outcomes, we're going to start with just looking at the response of v U.S. imports from Vietnam. Here we have a slightly longer time period. We can go back to 1996 using ComTrade data. The pre-period from 1996 to 2000 shows relatively small coefficients, all pretty closely um, uh, around, uh, located around zero. And then you see this immediate sharp jump up in year 2000, um, consistent with the aggregate picture that we showed ahead of time that the pattern of export growth across industries is strongly correlated with the bilateral trade agreement. And this continues to grow quite rapidly up until about 2008, the timing of the global financial crisis, and then moderates and is quite um, you know, relatively flat, very slowly up, uh, sloping upwards still towards the end of our time period. Right. So I just want to highlight, even though with our firm data, we don't unfortunately have a, a long pre-period, um, we do with the import data, and there's no evidence of any uh, pre-existing trends that are correlated with the trade agreement. So I'm not going to have the pictures here if anyone wants to talk about it during the question and answer period, but I'm just going to highlight quickly what we find about you know, changes in industry size. We find that industries that were subject to the larger um, U.S. tariff reductions, that they expand relative to those that were subject to the lower tariffs. And we see this for three different outcomes that we've been highlighting so far for the number of firms. So we see the net firm entry into the high tariff cut industries. We see net employment growth in the high tariff cut industries. Um, and then we also see revenue growth, although the, the results are a bit noisier here. Similar to the pattern that we observe for imports from the US to Vietnam, these effects cumulatively grow for five to six years after the BTA quite rapidly, after which they continue to accumulate, but at a, a slower rate. Okay. What we're gonna try to do now in my remaining time, about looks like about 10 minutes or so, is we wanna sort of shift now from analysis across industries to within industries, where we're gonna really start to highlight you know, the differing responses between foreign, domestic, and private firms for the, for the reallocation. Okay. To do so, we're gonna, first I just wanna do a little bit of a quick notation so that everyone's on board with what we're trying to do here. So we're gonna be taking a look at changes in employment shares within an industry by ownership O, so that includes state, private, and foreign firms, by the status of the firm, whether they're a continuing firm, whether they're an entrant or whether an exeter, it's gonna be relative to 2000 as the baseline. So capital E here is just gonna represent total employment, you know, for example, in industry J at time T and our baseline industry J at time uh, 2000. And what I wanna highlight here is that as the year changes, the potential definition of each firm as to whether it's a continuer or an exeter will also change over time. So for example, think about a firm that exists in our data in 2000, continues to operate up until 2004, right? So for all of our years, T up till 2000 and including 2004, that firm is gonna be defined as a continuer. But then once we hit year 2005, that firm is now exited. And thus its initial employment share is now gonna be switched from being defined as a continuer to an exeter, okay? So what this is gonna do is gonna allow us to look at the you know, cumulative changes over time due to entry and exit and continuing firms. We're going to estimate this regression to the change in the employment share. So we're in first differences now. We're going to estimate this separately for each ownership status and time combination. This is going to allow, for example, you know, our theta OST for you know, any aggregate changes. For example, if um, you know, there's high foreign entry, right, just in a particular year, this is going to be absorbed by allowing for these uh, effects to vary across ownership, status, and year. And what we're going to be interested in is, again, collecting these beta OST, which are going to vary over time, and then plotting the effects over time. So I'm going to start quickly with just um, aggregate effects across um, continuers, entrants, and exiters without doing the decomposition by ownership type. And the results um, for entry uh, suggest that, you know, yet this entry plays an important role in terms of employment shares are relocating towards entrants. Exiters, not so much. We really don't see um, at the aggregate level excluding differences in ownership. We don't really see differences in terms of the exit pattern in terms of how it's contributing to employment share. But we do see a strong reduction in the employment share due to continuers. Okay. The same figures on this um, page just provide the 95% confidence intervals um, separately for the, for the continuers on the left, the entrance in the, the middle, and the exiters on the right. What I really want to turn to highlighting now, though, is that 
these aggregate effects across continuous entrance and exiters hides important variation across the different ownership groups. Okay? And in particular, it really sort of hides the role of foreign entry. Okay? So now we're doing the, the same decompositions, the, the same regressions, but now looking at entry among foreign firms, um, continuing foreign firms and exiting among foreign firms. So the long dash red line, this is our um, foreign entry. It's a really, really strong a mechanism for the reallocation of employment shares. Industries that saw larger tariff cuts on average saw a significant shift of employment towards firms that have entered post-2000. At the same time, the existing foreign firms, the ones who were already in Vietnam in 2000, they're losing employment share within these industries, um, but no real significant pattern for, for exit. Um, and indeed, these patterns, particularly for entry, are statistically significant at the 95% level as well as the decline for foreign continuers. I don't unfortunately have time today, I think, to show the same graphs for state and private. So what we've chosen to do instead is prevent uh, a summary table that basically takes our coefficients as of 2017, so the long run period. Okay, so for example, you know, we saw these for foreign, the coefficient out at the end of the time period in 2017 was 0.73. For foreign continuers, we saw a loss in market share of 0.29. Uh, as the coefficient. For state and private, so here this is reporting the same um, the coefficients from similar regressions, we see that you know that net effective entry that we saw before that was much more muted. This really hides the fact that it's foreign firms that are entering in response to the trade agreement, not state or private firms. In fact, private firms, although the coefficient is not statistically significant, they are on average are entering industries that saw large, um, lower tariff cuts, not the, the high tariff cut industries in terms of how they're contributing to the employment share reallocation. In terms of interpreting the magnitude, um, I've just to give one example, focusing on the 0.73 coefficient for foreign firms in terms of entry, if we think about this in terms of the average tariff reduction, which was about 0.24. Um, this would suggest that the employment share in an industry uh, for foreign entrants, for one industry that received the mean tariff cut as opposed to no tariff reduction, saw the employment share shift by about 18 percentage points to foreign entrants, right? So it's, it's a fairly large um, quantitative reallocation towards foreign entrants happening in response to the BTA. Now, what I'd like to do for the remaining five or so minutes is Focus a little bit more on this foreign entry channel, but start by. You have six minutes to be precise. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, is to first take a step back to the aggregate level and not focus about foreign entry and how it varies with the, the trade agreement and the tariff cuts, but instead just look at what's happening to foreign entrants during this time period in comparison to private entrants and state owned entrants. So, on this figure, what we're doing is we're tracking one cohort of foreign affiliates that are entering in 2001. We're going to track this cohort of entrants over time and look at how their employment evolves over time. So first, the, the dash blue line is looking at the cohort that survives over time and just plotting their initial employment. So out by 2017, this would be foreign entrants that entered in 2001 and survived to 2017. On average, the ones who survived, they were initially larger. They were about 190 workers as compared to when the cohort entered in 2001, they were about 160, 165. But the really striking pattern here is that among those foreign entrants that survived is that they grew extremely rapidly over a factor of four between 2001 and 2017, right? So when we're thinking about foreign entry, we wanna think not only about you know, the point in time entry, but also about their subsequent um, changes in employment. On this subsequent graph, what I've done is I've taken that same two lines from the previous graph and now just normalize them to one. So we're looking at the relative ratio of contemporary employment to initial employment. And so that's this dash blue line um, comes from the previous graph, right, which shows, you know, almost a factor of five growth in employment for the foreign, co foreign um, cohort of entrants in 2001. Doing the same analysis for domestic private firms suggests that on average among those who survived from 2001 up to 2017, their employment only increased by a factor of about 1.5. And for the state entrance in the 2001 entry cohorts, they do show some initial in, um, growth in employment, but then actually over time, they decline in relative size by 2017. So there's a really striking difference in the aggregate behavior of foreign entrants compared to domestic private entrants. And what we wanna do now is take this aggregate pattern and kind of map it back into what we were doing before to take advantage of this long time period of data that we have so we can think about the employment reallocation hitting towards foreign entrants, how much of that is due to just the initial entrance, the initial entry size of the foreign affiliates, 
versus how much of that is due to, okay, you've entered in 2000 or two, sorry, 2001 or 2002, but then how much do you continue to grow after that in response to the trade agreement? So the figure on the left here is conditioning on initial size of the foreign entrants. And the graph on the right is saying, okay, well, conditional on initial size, what then happens in terms of your employment changes over time? So we can see that up until about 2010 or so, roughly these two margins are operating pretty much with an equal magnitude. Both play an important role that there's new firms entering the high tariff cut industries, and that's contributing to a shift of employment towards foreign entrants. But, but what we're able to observe with our long time period of data is that, you know, sort of post 2010 or 11, it's this subsequent growth that becomes a more important margin of how the employment is reallocating within industries towards foreign entrants, right? So it kind of highlights one of the strengths of our data and one of the contributions relative to the existing literature is this long time period, of, you know, allows us to observe the shift of employment, not only towards foreign entrants, but then their change in employment over time as well. So to kind of wrap up, you know, um, what we've done so far in the paper, right, is we, we're looking at the FDI responses to tariff cuts. You know, we find that they follow a similar cumulative pattern um, in terms of exports in response to this big policy change of a U.S. Uh, reduction in tariff supply to imports from Vietnam. An important context point here, which I mentioned earlier, but just want to highlight again, is that Vietnam was already open to manufacturing foreign direct investment. And then it's this introduction of new export opportunities afterwards. We see that Vietnamese exports expand to the U.S. due to the tariff cuts with the effects increasing over time. And that's in results that are not reported today, but I do have available if anyone wants to talk. These exports to the U.S. are mainly driven by non-related party trade. Um, and this is consistent with the primary sources of FDI in Vietnam during this time period are Taiwan and South Korea. And thus, it sort of highlights the fact that it's important to examine potent all potential sources of FDI, um, not just one source. The last thing I want to highlight, which again, unfortunately, I don't really have time to, to talk about in detail today, but the export growth, as I mentioned, is initially to the U.S., and then it kind of slows after about eight or nine years. But then we see this prolonged effect where it continues to grow um, in a pattern that's correlated with the trade agreement in, uh, to other destinations. So in conclusion, we think the main takeaway message from our work is that entry and ownership are two important factors to take into account. When one's trying to look at the short and long run impacts of lower um, trade policies for reaching important export markets, we find important differences um, in the effects of lower tariffs in a large export market, in this case, the US, on how foreign and private domestic firms in a low income country respond relative to the, the state owned sector. We see that this expansion is primarily driven by foreign firms over private domestic or state owned firms. We do actually see a lot of domestic firm entry. However, as highlighted in that uh, previous graph about the lack of growth um, among private firms, not only do they start smaller, but they just subsequently don't grow nearly as much as the foreign firms do. And so this highlights, you know, we think the importance of studying you know, the response, you know, just to a one-time trade shock, but over a long time period, um, in this case, 16 years, as this foreign entry drives overall relocation through two margins, the initial foreign entry, and then the subsequent growth of foreign entrants um, post-entry. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today and look forward to any subsequent questions that uh, people might have. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this is great. I love this paper. Um, so I there, there was some activity in the chat, which I think uh, um, Nina addressed. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions myself <laughs> before we uh, we open to the to the audience, so I'm gonna exploit my my role as chair. Um, so you know, as I started talking, I was thinking, why should foreign affiliates be different? And you gave me the answer I was expecting. Basically, uh, so they are more foreign oriented; they are less financially constrained, which I think is great. It's perfectly aligned with with what we know about multinationals. I know that probably you don't have these things uh, in your data. But I think that it would be really nice uh, to know something about whether the supplier networks are different, just to tie what you're doing also with, with the previous paper and about the composition of their labor force. And of course, this is wishful thinking because I believe you, you actually don't have information about this. But the other thing that you do have information about uh, is the fact that you have uh, different uh, affiliates of the same firm located in the same country, right, in Vietnam. So that is a margin that I think it would be really interesting to exploit more. So to me in particular, it would be really interesting to know whether when you see this very large entry of foreign firms, whether these are uh, 
uh, affiliates of firms that were already existing in Vietnam. So it's kind of like a, an intensive margin of more affiliates within a country of where there is a new entry of affiliates in Vietnam for firms that were not previously already operating in Vietnam. And then another thing that I wanted to ask, uh, you talk about the long run effects, maybe there is something I missed in the presentation. Uh, I wanted to know what you think are the mechanisms that distinguish like short run versus long run responses. Okay. And, and there are uh, a lot of hands and, 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 uh, and questions, so I'll, I'll let you take that. Great, um, so I'll start with your first question. Um, we were actually really hoping to be able to say more about that ourselves um, as well. Um, and maybe you might know some additional data sources we can look into. Um, we tried matching the, our enterprise data with data from, from Orbis to try to get information on the global ultimate owner. Um, but the matching for the VMEs data just unfortunately was quite poor. Um, so at best, what we can do, I think, so far is where, where we have the name information for the firms, which we don't on a systematic basis, we can provide anecdotal evidence, right? So, you know, for example, like Samsung, you know, they're new to Vietnam post BTA, you know, but we have seen some examples of some Taiwanese clothing producers who did have one plant in Vietnam prior to the BTA, and they subsequently opened others. But I think, unfortunately, at least right now with our data, we can't examine that on a systematic basis. Um, you know, maybe we can talk if you know some additional data sources that we could look into that we might be able to to match with the with the Vietnamese data. Because, yeah, we hope that we could have said more because I, I thought that would have been a really interesting thing to to be able to say. Um, in, in terms of the mechanisms, um, again, unfortunately, we're, we're a bit limited there. Um, we ideally would like to um, been able to match this, say, with customs transaction data, right? Because I think one of our hypotheses for about the long run effects particularly when we see that the pattern of growth in response to um, exports to the U.S. sort of slows around 2008 or 2009, but then we continue to see growth to other export destinations, is one of our thoughts there is it might be that, you know, you first enter Vietnam to export to the U.S. market, but then from there you start to expand, right? That you use Vietnam not only to export to the U.S., but you start to export to, to the EU, to Japan, to, to other countries. Um, but again, unfortunately, with the data we have available to this time, I don't think we can get at that mechanism. Um, if you have other ideas, I mean, that was, I think, our leading idea so far. Um, but if you have other ideas, we'd be happy to hear them. And maybe others in the, the crowd might as well, too. Um, but yeah, I don't want to monopolize the discussion. I'm sure we'll have other occasions to talk about this. I see hands by Paula, Cecilia, and Guzman. So I'm just going to go in the order where I see you in my, in my screen. Paula? Uh, thanks, Stefania. Uh, I, my, my, I find, you know, these findings super interesting, um, you know, this idea that the firms that are really uh, growing in market size are foreign firms coming mostly from Taiwan and South Korea. I think this is, you know, striking finding. Uh, one um, a question is to what extent you can try to explore in the paper, you know, what, what might be the driver of, of that, I guess. Two main hypotheses, you know, one is the one you mentioned about, um, you know, uh, credit constraints, no? the fact that these foreign firms have easier access to capital. Um, a, a second hypothesis is this idea that, you know, there are some fixed uh, export costs or market entry costs, and maybe these firms were already exporting to the US from uh, their home locations, so it's easier for them than for uh, you know domestic producers to enter the U.S. market and, and export. So I was wondering uh, to what extent you can use your data to say a bit more about about this. Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we've talked about credit and, and financing before. That's maybe something that uh, that we can revisit. Um, in terms of the, the the second thing you suggested, you know, I, I think absolutely one of the things that's happening here to sort of take this example of a, the Taiwanese clothing manufacturer. Um, you know, many of these are firms that almost certainly are already using other countries, right? Like when, whether it's China or Indonesia to you know, uh, have affiliates that are going to export to the U.S. So I think absolutely they you know, have an advantage relative to private domestic firms in Vietnam in terms of being part of those global supply chains already, right? And already knowing how to access the U.S. market. And what this gives them is sort of a cost advantage in terms of production of maybe, you know, opening a new plant in Vietnam instead of opening it in Thailand. For example, right? You know, I, I suspect that that's a, a you know a strong component of what's happening here. Um, but again, unfortunately, I don't know. You know, if, if there's data that would allow us to do that, I would love to do that. Um, I think that would be super interesting. Um, so, if you've, you know, again, if anyone knows of what we could do to kind of track that down, because I, I think that's an important part of what's happening. And our 
I don't think our data would allow us to, to get at that, unfortunately. Um, um, I mean, but if you knew, for example, I don't know to what extent you know the, the identity of the firm owners, you just know the, so that, you know, you would know whether the same firm is already exporting to the U.S. from, from other countries. I don't know to what extent you can do that. Um, yeah, I guess to, the custom so, I mean, data, maybe that, that could be possible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that suggestion. Um, cause we do know, um, you know, for firm names that are obvious, right. We can sort of identify those, um, relatively easily in the Vietnamese data for, for the firms that have it. Um, but for other firm names that we, you know, it's harder for us to, to recognize I, I think it would be more challenging to figure out exactly whether they're using other countries already. Um, but if there's good data sets to do that, I think that would be a really interesting, um, follow up to, to do. You know, just the last comment. Um, if we think, is not market access, but is finance. You know, maybe you would observe, uh, you know, cash-rich firms from other industries that are entering, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if it's market access, you would expect a firm in the same industry who is already exporting to the U.S. from Taiwan. And if it's the capital channel, you would expect a cash-rich firm from Taiwan in a different sector that is, you know, buying buying the firm. So right. you could look at this pattern to to try to separate these two potential stories. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question by Cecilia. Right, so um, let me start by echoing Paula and Stefania's comments, uh, compliments on the paper. It's, uh, it's super interesting. And at the risk, so the first part of my question, I'm almost risking repeating what Paula said too much. Uh, this literature on FDI is plagued with selection problems. Here, I feel that potentially you can get around them if you have, because of industry characteristics, perhaps in South Korea and, and the Taiwan, but perhaps elsewhere, you can build some predictions of which industries are more likely to um, build affiliates and interact that with the tariff cuts, you can get some exogenous variation. Mm -hmm. and, and then if you do that, but even if you don't, it would be interesting to dig more de into details of the links between the foreign direct investment expansion and the um, say the shrinkage or exit of, of the domestic firms as in competing firms or in similar localities or do the, and how do the industries kind of in Javorkic's line upstream and downstream, how do these firms share the domestic firms relative to others, especially if look at the location, if you have some information on the location. So I'd like to see a little bit more of that the entry and expansion side and linking the FDI to domestic. Okay, um, so we definitely do have location information um, and you can see that you know, the, the foreign invested firms are really strongly located across about four or five, maybe six provinces that are quite uh, geographically close to the major ports in Vietnam, right? Um, right. You know, at a, at a very aggregate level, it makes sense from the point of view that foreign firms are responsible for about 75% of Vietnam's manufacturing exports. Mm -hmm. State-owned firms in comparison are much more geographically dispersed throughout the countries. Um, and I, off the top of my head, have less than a, of a certainty about the geographic dispersion of, uh, of the domestic private firms. Um, but my guess would be they would be sort of somewhere in between the state-owned firms, which are more right, likely. The question, to, sorry. Oh, sorry. the question was more exploiting location to link the most yeah. affected private or state-owned domestic firms to the entry of FDI. Yeah, so I, I guess what I'm to say, I, think, I think we should be able to do that. We'd be able to do like a, a cut of the data or an interaction one way or the other to try to see um, how state entry and, and private uh, responses differ in the most intensively affected foreign direct investment zones compared to, to other locales, for sure. Yeah. So we have only one minute left and there is one more question by Guzman. I'm gonna take that one and then we should wrap up. Okay, I think mine is relatively short. So I found uh, extremely interesting the table where you show entry and exit rate by, by different types of, of firms. Uh, you show that entry is lower and exit is higher in state-owned enterprises. So for me, it's kind of intuitive to have different entry costs uh, by, for different firms, but the, the exit is what a little bit puzzles me. Um, we're not very... Um, let's say we're not very used to think about exit in terms of different costs. Uh, for example, the medics model, there is no, there is no cost for exit. Uh, so I, I was wondering what, what, what do you think about uh, the differences in e exit rates? 
That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure if, if Nina or Wan, Wan Fong might have something uh, to say in addition to this, because um, I don't think this is something we've thought about too much. Um, but for the state-owned sector, this is part of an aggregate reform that's happening in the state-owned sector, that the, the government is within manufacturing is sort of letting these firms go, um, but is not doing so within services. So there's kind of bursts of activity where state-owned firms are privatized or closed, um, and then that stalls over time. Um, so, you know, I think the high exit rates are partly driven by that, right? Just that the, the, st the government is trying to um, retrench the, the state, with, at least within manufacturing. For the private sector, uh, I, I don't think we've really talked about this too much among the three of us. Um, but my first thought would be just that this is a, a relatively new burgeoning private sector um, where there's going to be potentially a, a lot of entry and subsequent exit as firms are, you know, trying and entering and doing new things and finding out whether it's successful or not. Um, and so the, the, to give a little bit further context, the, the private domestic sector is only legally allowed starting in about 1994, 1995. And then, so I think this is still part of this process of you know, an emerging private domestic sector. And so perhaps that helps to explain the high exit rates um, is that a lot of them are entering activities. And then after a few years, figuring out that we're not actually maybe that profitable and there's better opportunities for me to do something else other than running a small domestic private firm. That'd be my first guess. I don't know if Nina or Juan Fong is anything else. All right. Thank you, Brian. And thanks, everybody, for participating. I think we should uh, close this session. We're already two minutes late. And there is a 10 minutes break now. So we're going to uh, resume at 05. Our last session of the day is going to be on agricultural productivity and structural change. And Sam is going to lead us off talking about canals in India. So let's just jump right in. Go ahead, Sam. Thanks, Meredith. Can you guys hear me OK? Yep. All good. Yep. And is that sharing all right? Looks good. OK, great. Um, can I get a, get a warning about halfway through to help me uh, manage my time a little better? Will do. Thanks. Um, great. So thanks, thanks very much, everyone, uh, for attending this. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Ali Campion at Development Data Lab, uh, Doug Gollin at the University of Oxford, and Paul Novosad at Dartmouth College. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the long-run development impacts of agricultural productivity gains, studying uh, the long-run effects of these uh, irrigation canals in India. So the big question we're asking in this paper is, when do improvements in agricultural productivity translate into structural transformation in the long run? Um, and the empirical literature, which is vast and, and growing and very high quality, um, often gains traction on these questions with uh, within country variation, often looking at very short to medium run uh, effects. And uh, notably in a lot of the literature, generally speaking, um, labor mobility is considered pretty low, either because the, the effects are short run or, or by construction. Um, but we think in the long run, labor mobility is a lot higher, um, especially within countries, um, and that's worth studying. Um, and so here, what we're gonna do is study the long run effects of India's irrigation canals, which generate really large sustained differences in agricultural productivity across otherwise very similar locations. Uh, these irrigation canals are huge. They cover 22% of Indian municipalities um, and, and arguably perhaps even more are affected in some way by them. Um, and most of these canals, critically for our design, were constructed at least 40 years ago, um, many much longer than that uh, under the British Raj or under the princely states and in the early decades of independence. And so they offer a really good opportunity to study uh, what happens many, many years uh, after the, these agricultural productivity differences have been generated. Um, so what we're gonna do in this paper is um, assemble data at the municipality level. This is the village and town level um, with a starting uh, N of 600,000. So uh, our empirical design will throw out a bunch of, of these observations. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna collect data at this level on irrigation, agricultural activity, uh, population, non-farm activity from data on firms, living standards, human capital, and urbanization to really understand um, these long-run effects at a very, very high spatial resolution. And we're going to use three different identification strategies to estimate different lates um, to really characterize this long-run equilibrium. In our main specification, 
uh, we're going to use a regression discontinuity design that exploits the fact that the water from irrigation canals are distributed by gravity. And so the water flows downhill towards the villages that, low, that lie below the uh, elevation of the canal, but villages nearby that are just a little bit higher than these canals can't get access to this surface irrigation. The second, to try to understand the effects on regional urbanization, um, the growth of, of towns near these canals, we're going to use a, a diff and diff and exploit the timing of canal construction to estimate what happens to town growth in neighboring areas. And the third is that we're going to use uh, distant municipalities, basically comparing both treatment and control villages in our RD um, to these more distant municipalities to try to estimate the local spillovers and to put our, uh, our, our main treatment effects uh, comparing these canal villages to nearby villages uh, into some context. So just to give a preview of major results, um, more access to canal irrigation, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, leads to big changes in agriculture. This was reassuring to see. Um, they lead to more irrigation, more land under cultivation, uh, and higher agricultural productivity, particularly in the drier, uh, rubby, or, or winter growing season. And then beyond agriculture, we find big increases in population density um, and in education and in this nearby town growth, um, but really no significant overall impacts on the rural non-farm sector or on living standards, in overall living standards. Um, and so we're going to interpret these results through a model that's very closely related to the existing literature, but that adds labor mobility. Um, and, and, and make sense of these big uh, population gains without actual big gains in, in living standards, um, and then necessarily in, in rural firms at least. And so we think the big takeaway of this paper is that in the long run, um, wages are equilibrated by labor flows across space uh, after these agricultural productivity shocks, um, rather than across sectors within space, um, and structural transformation occurs not through growth of uh, non-agricultural firms in these rural areas that experience these agricultural productivity gains, but in nearby urban areas uh, that have various advantages in, in non-farm production. So to give a little history of canals in India, um, the high variance of rainfall in India, India is generally described as semi-arid, um, but the monsoon uh, climate is really, really high variability. Um, and so it makes irrigation critical for agricultural productivity in India. Under the British, uh, there were massive investments, both um, by the East India Company and then by the British Raj afterwards, as well as by many uh, private investors in canal infrastructure um, that basically took water from India's major rivers and distributed it over much wider areas than, than the rivers do themselves. Um, and this was the dominant irrigation source really until the rise of groundwater, until and the rise of, of being able to pump large amounts of water out from the groundwater table. Um, but even to this day, 52% of rural Indians live within a 10 kilometers of a major or medium canal. These are the canals that we're going to be studying here. And what you can see in this figure is in the dotted line, canals were the largest source of irrigation um, until about the 1970s when groundwater takes over. And, and now um, groundwater is considerably larger than canals, but canals really do still treat a very large portion uh, of India's irrigated land. Um, and another thing to notice is that there hasn't been sort of huge growth in irrigation canal uh, coverage uh, over the last several decades, meaning that we really think we're, we're estimating the long run impacts uh, of these canals. Um, so what do we know about uh, agricultural productivity and, and its effects on structural change? Well, this is a, a classic question in development economics, uh, going back to Johnston and Meller and really before, um, so Johnson and Meller highlighted linkages with non-agricultural sectors. Um, Matsuyama's theory paper in 1992 showed that the effects of agricultural productivity gains uh, on, are going to be very different depending on whether economies are open or closed. And so the higher agricultural productivity may crowd in uh, the non-farm sector if the economy is closed because it frees up labor for other activities. Um, and this can be extended to, to generating additional capital or generating demand uh, for these other sectors. But in the presence, uh, in open economies, what happens is agricultural productivity gains just lead to specialization in the sector that you have comparative advantage in, which is, uh, in this case, agriculture. 
More recently, uh, there's been a sort of growing uh, empirical literature on this that's really using exogenous variation to try to get at this question. A couple of papers really worth highlighting. Um, one is Gallen et al. 2019, where they show that at the country level, increased agricultural productivity uh, due to the green revolution led to increased national GDP. The other is Bustos et al. Uh, there are a couple of Bustos et al. papers, um, but the one worth highlighting here is the impacts really depend on factor intensity, that basically agricultural productivity change can be labor saving. And this is a case of GM soy in Brazil, um, in which case it actually crowded in manufacturing by freeing up labor from the agricultural sector versus labor intensive. And there they study the second maize growing season, which actually draws in labor uh, from the non-agricultural sector. So, uh, in the paper, we have this detailed conceptual framework where we have a, a model sort of uh, around the corner. Um, but the big idea here is the following. Um, labor flows across space in the short run are going to be small, but much higher in the long run. And so in the short run, when agricultural productivity gets shocked, um, these shocks get equilibrated through the labor, labor movement across sectors. Labor demand in agricultural agriculture changes um, and so that's going to lead to people who are stuck in place moving across the agricultural and non-agricultural sectors. But in the long run, we think that equilibration may happen through labor movement across space. And so in this paper, um, what we kind of sketch out is that agricultural productivity shocks are going to increase demand for the non-agricultural sector. Um, and in turn, this is gonna generate structural transformation, but transportation costs and agglomeration economies mean that urban areas might be the ones to grow um, rather than rural manufacturing itself. And it basically labor flows into the rural areas that experience these agricultural productivity gains, um, but doesn't actually end up changing wages uh, in those places. So to get at these questions, we assemble a huge amount of data. Um, as usual, in most of our papers, we use the Shrug data platform as our backbone. This is a, an open data platform that we've created that has data on uh, every village and town in India, uh, over the last 30 plus years. And we put together a large amount of data from various sectors. Um, we get a lot of data on agriculture from a combination of satellite imagery and the population census, um, as well as some other information from FAOGAZ and the socioeconomic and caste census. Um, we have information on irrigation that comes from a combination of uh, GIS data on the placement of all canals in India and the distance to them as well as the polygons of the command areas that they're supposed to serve with water. The population census has information on uh, different sources of irrigation and, and how much land is covered by them in every village. Um, and we have dates of construction on these canals from, from the Ministry of Water Resources. Uh, for living standards, we're going to use small area estimation to come up with a predicted uh, consumption measure. And then for non-farm economic activity, we have the universe of all firms uh, in 2013 from the economic census. So our main strategy in this paper is to exploit the fact that I mentioned before that water from canals flows downhill. Um, and so we can do a regression discontinuity using relative elevation. So we basically calculate the difference between the elevation of every municipality and the elevation of the nearest point on the nearest canal to get at whether that municipality could hypothetically get access to canal water or not. And here we're gonna define municipality elevation as the fifth percentile of its distribution within the municipality, because obviously elevation varies within municipalities, but um, there are different ways of doing this and our results are, are pretty robust to that. And so in pictures, uh, here's what we do. We consider two villages that are similar um, and relatively close to each other. The canal gets constructed and because of gravity, the village that's slightly downhill from the canal can get access to it, um, but not the village that's close to it, but uh, slightly uphill from it. This leads to greater agricultural productivity in the village getting the canal water. And the question we're asking in this paper is, does that greater agricultural productivity translate into structural transformation and other non-farm economic outcomes? We're gonna have a, a secondary strategy using command area boundaries. Um, so instead of ESTA generating our regression discontinuity in, in Z space, in elevation, we can do this in XY space and basically compare villages on either side of the command area boundary. Um, it's our backup strategy because we think these command area boundaries may be endogenously drawn uh, by the bureaucrats who are designing these canals. 
Um, but it does give us an opportunity to see whether the, the results hold in a very different complier set. So we define our analysis sample as all of these municipalities that are within 10 kilometers of these, these major and medium canal branches. Um, and we define a bandwidth of, of plus or minus 50 meters in elevation from the nearest canal for relative elevation. Um, but we, we show in the paper robustness to this, uh, this bandwidth choice. Um, for the command area strategy, we're gonna choose municipalities within 25 kilometers from the command area boundary. Now, we're only gonna keep municipalities from subdistricts where the average treatment and control group ruggedness is balanced. Um, we calculate ruggedness for every village. Um, what we don't wanna be doing is comparing villages down in valleys to villages up in the hills. Um, and that's why the villages down uh, below are getting irrigation, but we don't wanna attribute the differences to them entirely to the irrigation. Um, so we drop all the places where there are basically really big differences in ruggedness between uh, the treatment and control sets just within subdistricts. Um, we, we also drop any subdistricts, the fixed effects do this, but we, we drop any subdistricts that just don't have any treatment or control villages. Um, and we also are gonna do in our main specification that we show robustness to this as well, uh, a donut hole approach. Um, basically because villages, they're very, very close to the elevation of the canal, uh, are sort of contaminated. The, the villages that we put into the control group actually may have a bunch of access to uh, canal water. The villages that we put into the treatment group, a large share of that village might not have access to the canal water. Um, so we're going to drop municipalities just that have this elevation within a couple of meters, 2.5 meters of the canal elevation itself. Sam, so, you're at your 15 minute mark. All right, uh, thanks. So uh, first we show balance. And we find that uh, these treatment and control villages are, are highly balanced on geophysical features like ruggedness. Um, there's a small negative uh, difference in rainfall. Uh, it's like three tenths of a percentage point, but it's actually negative. So the treatment villages actually get a little bit less rainfall than the control villages. And so that would actually work against our, uh, our uh, mechanisms. Um, but also in crop suitability that we get from the FAO, um, these villages look very, very similar. So this is a really standard RD specification. Uh, we're just estimating a treatment effect based on the jump, controlling linearly for relative elevation on either side of the cutoff, subdistrict fixed effects, and a couple of geographic controls for, for ruggedness uh, and for rainfall. So here we can see the big jump uh, in uh, irrigation, canal irrigation specifically at the cutoff, but also that within the donut hole at least, we're finding a lot of contamination that villages that lie in our estimation below the canal seem to get a bunch of canal water. Villages that, that lie, uh, uh, sorry, uh, that lie above the canal get a bunch of canal water, that lie below the canal um, are getting less canal water than villages just, just a little bit lower down. So here you can see in an RD bin scatter that we get a big jump up both in our relative elevation and our command area measures uh, in canal irrigation itself. So, the next several slides are just going to be coefficient plots, actually normalized treatment effects, uh, normalized by the standard deviation of the uh, outcome variable and control villages, uh, basically summarizing the whole paper. Um, and so first we consider irrigation outcomes. And what we find is that total irrigation area uh, increases considerably about two tenths of a, of a standard deviation. Um, this is driven by, by large effects on canals. Um, and no effects on tube wells, which are pumping water up from the ground, or uh, on other sources of irrigation as captured by the census. So, you know, that's stage zero. The canals are bringing irrigation. Stage one is what's happening to agricultural productivity um, or agricultural outcomes broadly. And what we find is first uh, a bit of an impact on the extensive margin. Villages that get canal water are dedicating a higher share of the village land to agriculture, to cultivation. Um, when we look at agricultural productivity as measured by this satellite imagery, because unfortunately India doesn't have good data on agricultural productivity directly measured at the village and town level, um, what we find is no changes in the monsoon season when the water primarily comes from the sky um, and, and often too much of it. Um, but in the rubby, in the uh, winter growing season, what we basically find is big jumps up. And this is exactly when we think the canals are, are delivering most of their water. When we turn to non-farm outcomes, the primary effects that we find are actually on population density. So we find these really, really large effects on population density. Um, 
And if I show you in the table, what you can see here uh, in uh, panel C in the first column, we find a 13% increase in population density in the canal villages. Okay. Um, oh God, that link didn't work. Sorry. Um, but when you look at uh, consumption or when you look at outcomes in our non-farm firms, what you find is basically no significant effect on either living standards or on the share of workers that are in these non-farm firms. Even when we break this out into different sectors, even when we look in the last row there, that's agro-processing. We can see all the different sectors of these firms. We see that even agro-processing doesn't significantly increase in the villages that are getting these big increases in agricultural productivity and, uh, and population. We do find education effects across the board. There's more education in the canal villages than there is in the non-canal villages. And this is true whether we look in, in the socioeconomic caste census where we can see attainment by different levels of schooling or uh, the literacy rates in the population census. So our theory tells us that the returns when labor is mobile, uh, but land is not, then the returns to the fixed factor land should increase when these villages get more canal water. Um, but the returns to the mobile factor labor should equilibrate. And we're gonna test for this um, by looking at living standards by household land holding. And so first what you can see in figure A on this uh, slide is that the share of landowners is going down in the village. So the gains in population to these villages are disproportionately driven by an increase in the, la in the landless share. Landless workers are flowing in to work in these, these canal villages. Um, and I should say they're flowing in on net. We don't know because we don't observe migration flows the extent to which these population gains are driven by na greater natural increase that we don't find fertility effects uh, or mortality effects. Um, so natural increase versus inflows or reduced outflows. Um, we're just seeing the overall population gain. So we can say that it's about net migration because we don't see this sort of effects on natural increase, um, but we don't know whether it's inflows versus reduced outflows. Um, the land holding size uh, doesn't change. Uh, overall, but conditional on being a landowner, uh, your, your land holdings go down a little bit. Um, but what we're mostly interested in here is on the consumption distribution. And so what you can see here is that the overall effects for landowners are positive while they're not for landless workers. And actually when you look across the different land holding quintiles, we really find that in the, qu the first quintile of landowners um, who have less than about 1.3 uh, acres of land, they don't find, uh, they don't get any significant gains to their consumption. It's only when you have more and more land that you start seeing these significant gains uh, in landowner consumption. And looking at educational attainment, we do find disproportionate effects on landowners who we think are, are just benefiting economically disproportionately from these gains. But we do actually find that even the landless workers are showing some signs of, of higher education. We, th this figure summarizes all of these results that I've just shown you, but in the alternate uh, regression discontinuity where we look at the command area boundaries rather than at relative elevation, and we basically corroborate uh, the main results. Again, this isn't our preferred specification because of the potential endogeneity of drawing command area boundaries, but we basically find the same results. Increases in irrigation, um, higher agricultural productivity, though in this case, it's in the, the monsoon season rather than in the, in the rubby season, again, perhaps an indication that, that these boundaries are, are more endogenous than our elevation cutoff, um, but gains in, in population density, um, but without uh, effects on structural change or on, on overall consumption. We then turn to spillovers because it's possible that there are spillovers between treatment and proximate control municipalities that are generating a different local average treatment effect than the impacts we would get if comparing to areas that are not in the vicinity of canals. Even our control villages here are relatively close to canals and may be linked economically or benefiting from groundwater recharge that's happening from these canals. Um, and so we're gonna test this hypothesis by comparing the, the RD treatment in control municipalities to more distant areas that are more than 15 kilometers away from these canals. And therefore we think are less linked to the treatment villages that are experiencing these big agricultural productivity gains. And we're gonna control for a, a large set of geophysical characteristics that I showed you in the balance table earlier to make sure that we're really comparing otherwise similar villages. 
and don't really have time to get into it today, but basically we find no overall effects on population consumption or non-agricultural spillovers. Um, and we think that this lack of major differences between our control villages in the RD and these more distant villages uh, that look very similar to them uh, really provide support for our main identification strategy, that we're not comparing sort of treated and treated villages here um, and therefore, you know, getting uh, null results on a, on a set of outcomes just because they're actually all experiencing, say, big gains in, in non-farm activity. We then turn to urbanization. Um, so our main identification strategy, our main sample is including both what are considered towns and villages now, um, but we're really only identifying off of the very local effects of canal infrastructure. We're asking whether municipalities that are getting this higher agricultural productivity, they're getting more canal water, um, are, are growing more and are showing signs of, of greater uh, non-farm activity. But it doesn't identify the potential growth in nearby areas that could be uh, going through structural change because of the increased population and, and demand uh, for non-agricultural outputs that are coming from this greater agricultural productivity. Um, and so we wanna be able to look kind of a, a bit broader than, than just what the RD allows us to do. And so to study regional urbanization, what we're gonna do is actually take uh, advantage of the fact that in the population census, they often offer data on town population in every decadal census since 1891. I actually think it's since 1901, but the point remains that we have a long panel of town populations. Um, it does condition on the fact that the towns existed in the 2011 population census. So it is conditioning on the fact that, the, that these were considered urban spaces. Um, but what we're gonna do is take advantage of the timing of the introduction of these canals. Um, and we're gonna, so we're linking to canal construction dates and we're gonna see in a diff and diff setup whether the, um, there's more town growth when the canal comes into an area. So here I'm showing you the, the basic kind of two-way fixed effect approach. Um, where we're going to be regressing town population or a binary indicator for a, the appearance of a town on a dummy for a command area being in the, a town catchment area, which we define crudely in our first pass as, as 30 kilometers, but I'll show you the more continuous measure, um, but also to an alternate measure of, of canals, which is taking more advantage of the fact that we know how big these canals are and saying what share of the town catchment area uh, is covered by a command area. And we're gonna have fixed effects for towns and we're gonna have fixed effects for time for the decade that we observe these things. Um, so I'm showing you these kind of more uh, basic two-way fixed effect results today, but we get the same results when you do Goodman-Bacon uh, or, or the other sort of more cutting edge stuff in the diff and diff literature. Um, here you can just sort of see visually what's going on. Um, we consider just all of the uh, towns where we can see 40 years of, of data, both before and after canal construction. And what you can see is a clear trend break in the population growth. Here we have population in logs on the left-hand side. You can see a clear trend break in growth um, around the timing of canal construction. You can see the same thing in uh, the diff and diff. Uh, so here we're looking at the existence of towns um, where you can see our towns crossing either the 5,000 population threshold, the 10,000 population threshold, or just overall town population. In all of these cases, um, there's higher growth in the towns after they get these, uh, these canals. We can actually, because we have GIS data on every single town and every canal in the country, uh, we can actually see how these effects vary by distance between the town and these canals. Um, and so basically what we do is we draw these rings around every town where we can see the share in every decade of, uh, of the area that's covered by canal command areas. And what you can see is there are large effects of these canals on towns that are within 10 kilometers, um, but there are still effects even further out. So the largest effects are being driven by canals that are really close to these urban areas, um, but even 20, 30, 50, we even see small significant results on some of these measures all the way out to, uh, to 100 kilometers away. So wrapping up, um, canals generate sustained differences in agricultural productivity, which offers a really good setting for testing the long run impacts of, of agricultural productivity on structural change. And so what we observe is that in the long run, many decades after these differences have been generated, um, the productivity effects of canals are equilibrated by labor flows across space rather than across sectors. 
We basically see labor flowing into the rural areas, but primarily working in agriculture and not changing the, the balance of labor between uh, the farm and non-farm sectors, but also flowing into nearby urban areas, which have much higher rates of, of non-farm activity. So structural change occurred, but, but it just occurred not in the villages themselves, but, but in these urban areas. Um, the key difference with much of the literature is really looking in the very long run over many, many decades. Um, it should be emphasized, of course, that the context here is early to mid 20th century India, and that might be important for these results as well. Um, we find these limited changes in rural areas, which is consistent by work by us on rural roads, by others on rural electrification and so on, showing that even very large investments in uh, rural infrastructure, uh, which do have, have certain large effects, may have very limited effects on structural change. And we sort of conclude by saying that if structural change is occurring primarily through this process of urbanization, um, one of the things that we really need to understand better is how barriers to urban growth might be constraining uh, these effects of agricultural productivity gains on the overall process of structural change of an economy. So thank you. Great, thanks Sam, exactly on time. Um, lots of action in the chat. I think some of those may have sort of been answered. So let's start with uh, Paula and then maybe come back to some of those. Uh, thanks, Mary. So some a super interesting paper. Um, something that, um, you know, the first thing that I thought about uh, when you said that, uh, you know, the increase in agricultural productivity through this uh, irrigation didn't have an effect on local wages um, or, you know, local uh, consumption per capita is a Malthusian story, right? Uh, where all increases in agricultural productivity lead, you know, you have a spatial story that, you know, wages are equalized across space, but given the time period when this happened and the context uh, of India, right, where you know, people might be hitting this type of constraints where the number of kids you have depends on the food you have. Uh, have you looked at what happens with family size, you know, to see whether there is a Malthusian force there at play also? Yeah, so this is a great question. We, um, we look at the share of the population that is under six. Um, that's offered in the population census. We can also see like the age distribution in the in the socioeconomic caste census where we have the microdata. Um, and we don't see significant differences in that. Now we're observing these things many decades after the canals. And so we're not in as good a position to characterize the kind of transition path where along the way, maybe there was, we, so we're not seeing it now. There's not still kind of higher levels of, of, of uh, children per woman say, um, but, um, it, it is possible that kind of right after the canal was constructed where we can't see uh, fertility rates, maybe there were, there were higher rates. Um, and so we are putting together data on the 1951 um, census at the village level. And uh, I think in some areas um, we may have data on like the share of the population under six. And so in which case we might be able to kind of test for that like soon after, after a bunch of these canals were built. Um, we don't really, we're, we've been doing a little bit to try to look at um, kind of the effects of canals that were built very, very recently to try to characterize the short run versus long run effects. Um, we don't really, right now we're really trying to get to the bottom of do we trust the dates for very recent canals or is it that these canals were all basically built a long time ago, but some of them are being recorded as recent because of, uh, because of like rehabilitation projects basically. So if we can get to the bottom of that and identify canals with confidence that were built very recently, we're gonna be in a better position to characterize a bit more of this transition path and like the short run versus long run effects. But at least right now in the long run, we're not seeing higher uh, birth rates in the, in the canal villages. Tommaso? Uh, yes, thanks Verity. Hi Sam, S super interesting uh, um, paper. Um, I, I guess like, I have a bit of a general question because I would be curious to know, like, you know, how are you thinking about the tradability of goods? So you talked a lot about labor mobility, and then just, like, you know, conceptually how you're thinking about, you know, do you think that each uh, local area is a closed economy that price, that, you know, the markets close, uh, sorry, clear locally, 
or as India as one big market. And you know, part of the reason why I'm asking this is because I find it like you know very surprising to some extent that uh, um, you know the above and below canal you don't see any specialization, right? You know, because if you think of that one uh, as an open economy, at least locally, you will expect. Uh, the area with the higher productivity to specialize in agricultural production. But you don't see that, which to some extent suggests that there are frictions to goods mobility even very locally. Um, anyway, I just pretty much want to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so we're thinking of these as open economies. Um, I don't want to, uh, you know, be in too much tension with any of my earlier papers that argues that, that these villages kind of look like open economies. Um, no, but we, so we're thinking of these as open economies where basically very, very little non-farm production happens in any of these villages. Um, what you see from the economic census is just tiny, tiny employment in uh, non-farm activity. And, and the vast majority of that in rural areas is in services, is in like little shops and things like that. Um, the most manufacturing is, is by far is happening in the towns. Um, when you get these agricultural productivity shocks, more agriculture is happening in these villages, labor is moving in. To, uh, to, to meet that greater demand for agricultural uh, labor. Um, but these villages still aren't any sort of better or worse at, at generating uh, non-farm goods, tradable goods than they were before just because they weren't really doing it before and they continue not to do it now. Now, critical to this story is the fact that we think that there is increased demand for non-agricultural goods coming from these increases in agricultural productivity and from these higher population rates but they're just being met by towns, that, that towns have a productivity advantage, we think due to agglomeration, but maybe there are some natural advantages that are determining the placement of towns as well. Um, and so it's, it's this small subset of overall municipalities that are urban that are actually meeting that demand, that have the combination of agglomeration or electricity or transportation costs or whatever to actually produce these non-farm goods and, and they're meeting the demand of, of their sort of surrounding rural hinterland. So it's certainly possible that, that there are like very, very small changes, you know, that like a, a small increase in the price of land is crowding out what little tiny bit of manufacturing there is in these villages. Um, but we're getting pretty tight zeros here. So we can, we can reject, um, you know, economically meaningful changes in, in manufacturing production or employment at least. So sort of related to Tommy's question, but I mean, you guys are sort of really emphasizing that part of what's cool here is the long run look, which I totally agree with. That also sort of makes, that made it a little harder for me to think about both in terms of identification and like what we should expect to still be different across nearby villages, you know, 60 years later or whatever. So, so I guess kind of two parts to that question. So one is, you know, what should we think would be very different across these villages in the long run? And is there some way to use the canal timing also to kind of look at catch up or convergence or divergence or whatever we might expect over time? And then I guess the flip side of that is like, is there um, a way to look at how things are changing with the towns over time? So you guys seem to be thinking of this as kind of a like demand agglomeration driven story, but is there a way to see whether it's that or whether it's sort of like, differential migration from these villages or differential capital flows from the villages or you know it's I guess it's not it's not totally clear to me how what we should expect that change to come from over time. Yeah so we're also really interested in these difference between the short run and the long run and, and as I was saying in, in response to, to Paolo's question I think there are a lot of questions about what is the transition path look like sort of what's happening in the short run and then um, you know in our model what happens in the short run is that labor is not mobile. And so this big increase in agricultural productivity in these small open economies means that there's gonna be more specialization in agriculture. There's gonna be higher wages being paid to landless workers. So their kind of returns to this greater agricultural productivity are gonna be split between uh, those owning land and, and those owning labor. Um, but in the long run, you're gonna get this sort of net inflow of uh, landless laborers who are going to end up equilibrating wages across space and the villages go back to um, kind of where they were uh, before. You could enrich this with, with land and, and get a bit more crowd out um, of the non-farm sector even in the long run because land can't move across space. Um, but, but that's sort of the, the basic story that we're telling. And that's why we think we're seeing these non-effects, these consumption effects for the landed households, but not for the landless households um, in the long run. 
So I think the transition path kind of looks like landless laborers gaining in the short run because they're scarce. Um, but then in the long run, they're not scarce. People are moving in and, uh, and eating up any of the gains uh, that might be coming from increased demand for agricultural labor. Now, what's happening in the towns um, in the sort of transition? Again, a really, really good question. We just don't see much about towns in the long run. And so like really all we can see at the town level are these population rates uh, over the last hundred years. Um, and this is all coming from the fact that in the 2021, or sorry, 2011 census, they offer these town populations going, going all the way back. Um, I wish that they, they listed more variables. Um, if we, it would be like a, a huge addition to an already, I think quite sprawling, not, not, let's not say sprawling, rich paper, um, but, uh, but we could potentially taking our um, canal construction dates very seriously, kind of do this at say the district level and try to use district data going way back to try to see about like the growth of urban areas uh, from something like the National Sample Survey. Um, it would be an enormous lift for, I think, yeah, I'm, it, I'm not, it's not sure that we, we wanna add that to the paper, but, it, but I'm really interested in this question too. And, and may, maybe that goes into the follow-up paper. Awesome, all right. Unless there are, it looks like things are being answered rapidly on the chat. So unless there are really pressing things that anybody thinks we need to bring into the general discussion going once. Okay, great. Then um, thanks, Sam. Uh, let's move on. Thanks, and everyone. Really great question. Appreciate the feedback. Great. And Guzman will be presenting next. Hello, guys. Can you hear me correctly? Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. So thanks uh, to the organizers for including my paper and thanks for, to everyone for, for still being here. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to present this paper. Uh, this paper has been around for a while now. Uh, I have to say that uh, I changed a little bit its focus to, to make it, um, uh, I think, uh, I think it's it's more appropriate the way it is now. So some of you ha might have seen the, uh, me presenting this paper in its previous version, but but uh, yeah, you're probably not familiar with the version that you're about to see. So uh, stick around. Uh, so this paper is about uh, uneven product diversification and how this affects um, the agriculture uh, the expenditure shares on agricultural goods. Um, as everybody here knows. Uh, there is a clearer downward trend uh, in expenditure on agricultural goods, uh, and this can be seen both uh, in the domestic uh, on the domestic expenditure data and also on imports. Um, but the problem is that many countries remain specialized in uh, agricultural goods, so this poses a development problem for these economies. So this is just an illustration on the magnitude of if you are familiar with uh, the, the macro trend uh, in the in domestic expenditure in the US. This is just um, how the, the importance of agricultural goods has evolved in international trade. And this is using three different definitions of agricultural goods. Uh, you can see how the, the downward slope is, 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 the magnitude of the effect is massive. Um, and as I was saying, there are many countries that are specialized in agricultural goods. Uh, here you have the agricultural export intensity uh, in the map. And I, I, I like to highlight a couple of things in this graph. Uh, one is that, so this is a good way to, for me to explain that in this paper, I'm going to focus only on agricultural goods and that doesn't, ex that doesn't include uh, extractive goods. So I'm not going to talk about oil. I'm not going to talk about uh, metals or, or stuff like that. I'm only going to um, refer as agricultural as renewable uh, goods that you can get from, from the land, right? So that's why, for example, countries like Venezuela are very, very clear, or some countries in South Saharan Africa are clear in the map, um, appear, appear very light. Uh, the other thing I, I like to highlight in this graph, in, the, in this figure, is that not every country that it's uh, specialized in agricultural production is poor. Uh, so here you have some poor countries, uh, some middle-income countries, like for example Argentina and Uruguay, 
and also some uh, relatively rich countries like New Zealand. Um, many people ask me why Greenland is so so dark in, 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 the, in this map. Uh, the reason is that 95% of their exports are, are fish and I'm including fish uh, in, in as an agricultural good as it's renewable and, and, and you can get it from, from natural resources. So the, 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 the good question is, why is this happening? Why is people uh, spending less and less uh, uh, money in, in relative terms uh, in agricultural production? And the structural change literature has two main culprits here, the income effect that comes when, when people have non-homothetic preferences, right? So when they, 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 as they get richer, they switch uh, their consumption preference towards more sophisticated goods. And the other is the price effect that comes from uh, the fact that when growth happens at different rates, uh, relative prices are going to adjust, uh, are going to actually go move to offset uh, changes in relative quantities. Uh, and, and, and these are the main two effects that the, that, the, that the literature has highlighted, especially when it comes to expenditure shifts and not to value added produced. Uh, so in this paper, what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose a new mechanism, which is uh, an even product diversification, or I am can also refer to this as uh, growth in the extensive margin, as opposed to what I call growth in the intensive margin, which is what drives, normally drives the price effect uh, in the existing literature. So I'm going to be very clear on, on how to split these two things. Um, but the main thing, so not only, I think highlighting this new mechanism is not, it's not only important just uh, to, to write a paper and say you have a new mechanism. It's also important because it's, it's, it's relatively different. It's very different, I think, to the, the explanations that have been proposed in the literature. So it's rooted. This is a mechanism that is rooted in technology, right, as the regular price effect, which to me means that can be targeted by policy. So governments, if, if you have a lagging sector in your economy, you can do something as, as a government to foster product production in that sector. So product diversification, in, in my view, is something that governments can foster with policy, uh, as opposed to changing worldwide preferences, right? There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, but different to the regular price effect, uh, when you focus on growth in the extensive margin, what you see is that relative prices and quantities go in the same direction. So they go, at, they go in, in the opposite direction as you would expect in the regular price effect. So let me illustrate just uh, with a very silly graph. Uh, when you grow in an intensive margin, you're pushing your supply through a downward sloping demand. And that's what if, so if you're growing more relative, so if, if you think of if the axis of this graph as relative prices and relative quantities, if you are growing more than the other sector, uh, then your price, your relative price should go down. Right? As opposed to that, when growth happens in the extensive margin, what you're doing is you're making more appealing your product and you're basically increasing demand. So it, it looks like what you would expect if you had um, a demand going in your favor, but it's actually just driven by growth in the extensive margin. So just diversify, diversifying production. And the trick here is just that what's considered as the price of what you're producing uh, is, a, is, a, is a changing animal, right? So what you're producing is changing over time. Uh, so in this work, what I'm going to do is I'm going to document a new growth fact, which is that diversification, which, which I'm going to call G, the rate of diversification in the agricultural sector is typically lower than the manufacturing sector. I'm going to present a simple model to show how this mechanism is going to affect uh, relative prices and expenditure shares. And then I'm going to quantify the importance of the, this mechanism in driving uh, expenditure shares moving away from agricultural production. Uh, I'm going to evaluate it at over 15% for the US. It's even higher for other developed economies, uh, especially in Western Europe. Uh, and the model is going to, I, I'm going to present a, 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 um, let's say a, a simplified version of the model that illustrates the, the effects. Uh, and then I'm going to, of course, uh, uh, make it more general for the quantification. But the model I'm going to present, I'm actually not going to present it. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things about it. It's going to focus only on the extensive margin of growth. So it's going to abstract from any other source of effects on expenditure shares, just to highlight exactly what growth in the extensive margin would produce. 
um, and it's going to feature two fully specialized regions. Um, and I'm going to justify this assumption later. Basically, this is uh, to, to get rid of uh, effects that um, wouldn't, wouldn't seem so, so uh, um, maybe intuitive in a, in a closed economy model. And the model is going to also give me a shed some light on why diversification is uneven uh, between sectors. Uh, I'm going to hint that it's basically driven by both uh, preference and technological considerations. Uh, of course, I'm relating to a whole bunch of literature, uh, the literature uh, showing that sectors are specific and show, exhibit different specificities. Uh, in terms of trade, I'm going to say, have something to say about uh, relative, relative prices um, uh, uh, when economies are specialized. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to relate to the research course just because I'm saying that specializing in agricultural sector can be harmful uh, in the long run. Of course, the entire literature on structural change from Lewis on uh, and some other strands of literature. So the first thing I want to show you is evidence on the fact that uh, diversification, product diversification happens at uh, different rates across sectors. Uh, I'm going to exclude the service sector. So I'm not going to say anything about the service sector. I'm going to focus only on agricultural and manufacturing, basically because uh, measuring extensive margin growth in the service sector, I think uh, it's very difficult or even impossible. So that's why also the model is going to be proposed only for the agricultural and for the manufacturing sector. And the estimations and the quantification are going to be very careful on excluding the service sector. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to use is international trade data, uh, which presents the benefit of being uh, very, having figures for very long uh, term and for a lot of countries uh, at different levels of disaggregation for different data sets. Of course, the higher the disaggregation, the, the, you, sacrif you sacrifice uh, time span, but that's going to be fine, I think. And when, when, what I'm going to do with this data is I'm going to slash the list of products that are being sold. I'm going to slash it in three. The extractive goods, I'm going to just drop. And then the manufacturing goods and the agricultural goods, I'm going to use uh, exports in these goods to count how many um, goods are being exported by a given country in a, in a given industry, in a given uh, time, uh, time tip, uh, period. Here, it could be 10 years. I, I can do it for, for different time periods, of course. Um, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm slashing this list uh, in, in three different parts just to show that my results are robust to where you set the line between agricultural and manufacturing goods. Uh, of course, when you count codes in a classification to establish action in the, in the extensive margin, it's important to know what's a, what's a code in these classifications. So just, this is just an example. Uh, at six digits, I can distinguish between uh, azuki beans and kidney beans, uh, which look roughly similar. Uh, this is supposed to illustrate that uh, at six digits, I, I think you, you, you get a good idea of goods that consumers can find uh, differentiated. Uh, and also I'm going to show the same things, the same facts uh, using domestic production data. For this, uh, for, for domestic production, it's uh, you, counting codes in classifications is not very, it's not very uh, illustrative uh, or um, yeah, illustrative because uh, basically production at the country level, it's normally, the, the, the classifications are normally tailored uh, at the production. So uh, it's hard to have any action on the, on the extensive margin uh, by counting codes. So what I'm doing here is really counting firms. Uh, so I'm, I'm counting how, uh, for, I, I get data for Eurostat and for the US Census Bureau and show how the amount of firms can change uh, in, in the different, in the two different sectors. Um, so in this graph, for example, I'm, I'm showing you one dot here is one country and for one 10 year period, what would be the um, rate, uh, the diversification rate in the manufacturing sector and in the agricultural sector in the vertical and the horizontal axis. So the first thing you can see here is that, uh, can you see my pointer too? Yes, okay. So the first thing I, I like to highlight here is that 
there is such a thing as grow in the extensive margin in the agricultural sector. Uh, the question arises quite often, um, but basically you, uh, uh, for you to get a, the idea on, on how this can happen, uh, you need to consider wh where I'm drawing the line of agricultural goods. So basically, if you're producing apples, um, you could produce apple juice, apple puree, or stuff like this, and that, that would count as um, agricultural-based products, and therefore you could you, you could diversify your production even when you're just sticking to apples, right? But of course, the other, the other thing that is more, even more important to highlight here is how the, the cloud of points is totally tilted towards in favor of the manufacturing sector, showing how um, diversification, product diversification happens much more in the manufacturing sector than the agricultural sector. And this graph is constructed using the four digit data. So the longer time span uh, uh, that I have uh, with the lower desegregation level. Um, and here's the same thing, but using the three export uh, data set that I have. So uh, six digits, five digits, and four digits for different periods of time. And the three diff different definitions that I use for what can be considered an agricultural good. This is the more restrictive list. This is the intermediate, and this is the um, less restrictive list. So you can see how the the fact is very is very is very robust uh, using the export data. It's an easy exercise to to to, to replicate, uh, and this is just table showing how. Uh, the difference is statistically significant. So here you have for the four digit data, one definition, the narrow definition, the, the, the intermediate definition and the more um, less narrow definition. And here is the average uh, diversification for, for all the countries and in the manufacturing sector and the agricultural sector, you can see the difference is significant. And this is using the four digit data, as I was saying before. This is using the five digit data, and this is using the six. You can see how as uh, you, you get more detailed data, uh, statistically the, the, significant, the, the difference becomes even more uh, clear uh, in the data. Um, of course, uh, it, it can be said that maybe there is more scope for diversification in the way um, codes are constructed in these in these uh, classifications. Um, two things to say about that. Uh, when you take the, 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 the more broad definition of agricultural good, the, the, more that in, the, the one that includes uh, a broader set of goods, you roughly have this, the same amount of codes available for countries to diversify in, in, both, in both industries. And also what I do here is an exercise in which since I cannot go deeper into classifications, I take the other direction and I go, uh, less deep, let's say. So I take for each uh, industry, in, instead of seeing how much diversification I have at six digits, I consider only two digit lines. And then I uh, see the average diversification within, within these two digit lines, or an exercise that would, that, that would give me, um, that would be less biased by the amount of digit, uh, sorry, uh, codes available in each, within each code. Uh, which within each industry. So I, this, the results are robust to doing this kind of exercise. And here is the showing um, for the three different definitions of an agricultural good. Um, how many, uh, the, the same fact with domestic production data, just showing that uh, firm growth, it's also more prevalent, uh, more prolific in the, in the manufacturing sector and the agricultural sector. Uh, here, each dot is a one country uh, and a 13-year period. Okay, so um, having shown the, the fact, uh, we can move to the model. I'm not going to present the full model uh, because uh, I think it's really not necessary for, for, for you to understand the idea. Um, and um, just highlighting the, 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 the main features, it's, uh, it's enough for today. So in, in the model, I'm going to have two regions, uh, the North and the South, one productive factor, which is going to be labor, two industries that are going to produce either manufacturers or agricultural goods. Each firm uh, is going to invest in R&D to develop a new variety and also engage in final good, product, final good production. 
the R&D efforts are going to generate spillovers only within the industry. So there are no spillovers across industries. Um, I, I think this makes uh, sense, but also in the international uh, setting, I'm going to present this paper, this, this model. Uh, it basically means, um, yeah, there are no spillovers across countries. Uh, trade is going to be perfectly free, so I'm not going to uh, use any trade shocks. And regions are going to be specialized. So the north is going to produce uh, manufacturing goods and the south is going to produce agricultural goods. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to present this as a, as, a, as a model where you have two, two regions and, and full specialization. So it's a, and, 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 and the relative prices, it's going to be in terms of trade, basically. But you could also think of this as a, as a closed economy um, uh, model where you have basically two parts of the country, one producing industry and the other producing agricultural goods, and they don't uh, have spillovers and also don't share the same labor force. Um, so consumers are going to have uh, a two-layer CES preference structure. Uh, first, they need to decide how much they're going to consume and save to get the expenditure at the country level, then how much they're going to use of this expenditure in manufacturing and in agricultural, and later, how much they're going to spend in each of the varieties within manufacturing and within agricultural. Um, the dynamic problem just gives us the, the typical URL equation. I'm not going to spend time on this. Uh, the, the, the first CES layer, uh, uh, we're going to introduce beta as the coefficient driving the elasticity of substitution between manufacturing and agricultural goods. Beta is going to be uh, important uh, later on, so keep beta in mind. Uh, and then alpha, I'm going to just define alpha as the share of, of the country expenditure that's going to be spent on uh, agricultural goods. And one minus alpha is going to be what's spent on manufacturing goods. Then the sigmas here are just the elasticity of substitution within uh, each of these industries across, across different varieties of the good. And um, yeah, so uh, trade is going to be free. Um, and that means that prices are going to be the same um, in, in both regions. Uh, the producers are going to pr uh, pr uh, invest in R&D and develop a new variety. Uh, they are going to produce this variety and sell it forever uh, as a monopoly in a Dixit Stiglit competition environment. And they are going to have constant markups. Um, and they're going to produce new varieties just by investing, uh, so devoting labor to the activity of creating new varieties. And there is um, a, a level of knowledge that's going to uh, augment um, the, the productivity of labor. And I'm going to set that just as the, as in the Roman model, uh, as the number of, of varieties existing in the, in, within the industry. So the, may, may, maybe just, uh, just uh, to, to highlight, to, to really illustrate what, what's special about growth in the extensive margin with the, considering the, the, the nested CES preference structure that I, that I showed you before, this would give you uh, this relationship between relative quantities and relative prices. Uh, this is if, if, if you spent a little time uh, working with these preferences, you derived this expression before, so it's very standard. Uh, so this is the, 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 the typical uh, equation that would tell you that if growth, if when you focus growth on, on growth on the intensive margin, when this when the manufacturing sector increases their output more than the agricultural sector, this ratio is going to go up, uh, and that means that the price of the agricultural good needs to go up uh, respect to with respect to the price of the manufacturing good. This is of course absent any action in the extensive margin, and there are many papers that have shown that have relied basically on this effect as their main. Uh, mechanism. Uh, in particular, I, I like to highlight Asimov Lamentura because they show that terms of trade, right? So the, the relative price when we're in, a, in, the, in an international context uh, with specialization, uh, the, the, they highlight these terms of trade effect where prices move as this relationship would predict, right? But when, of course, when you have access uh, to, to extensive margin growth, this ratio now can move over time, and this is going to loosen up uh, the tight relationship between quantities and prices that uh, this uh, equation predicts. Um, and of course, in my, in my model, in, 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 the, in the version of the model I'm showing now, uh, when you have no 
extensive intensive margin growth, uh, prices are going to move exactly in the opposite direction um, because of only having a growth in the extensive margin. So in the opposite prediction the direction as would be predicted by growth, uh, a model with growth in the intensive margin. So this is just uh, to, to go back a little bit on, 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 the, on the result I was highlighting before by Asemoglo Ventura. They predict that countries that, because they focus on growth in the intensive margin, they predict that there, is, there would be a negative relationship between the change in terms of trade for, of countries and their relative growth, um, or the growth in relative terms. And the negative relationship is there. This is what we see in, in the data. But when you focus, when you highlight the position of agricultural economies, economies that have remained specialized in agricultural goods, um, which are the ones that I'm highlighting here in bold, you can see how the relationship for them is actually the opposite. It looks positive. So um, I'm claiming that the extensive margin of growth uh, has a lot to do with this. <clears throat> and as I promised before, my model also gives me an expression for product diversification uh, in each industry, which looks like this. So diversification in sector in one sector, which could be agricultural or manufacturing, is going to have is going to depend on how much labor there is working on this sector. So the, a scale effect that you could actually remove, but uh, I didn't because um, yeah, doesn't I, I I don't think it adds too much. Uh, the cost of diversifying production, of course, plays a role here, and the elasticity of substitution within uh, the industry, which is the sigma. So basically, for the model to throw the fact that I, I showed you before, so that diversification is lower in the agricultural sector than in the manufacturing sector, I need a combination of these three inequalities to hold. And in the paper, I, I argue that the data actually would show that all three of these inequalities hold. I don't need all of all, of, all the three to hold, but I, I, the, 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 the evidence that's been there for, for a while now, for, so for example, for this one, I'm using Broad and Weinstein, uh, elasticity of substitution, you can play with them to, to, to uh, the, uh, arrive to one estimation for um, the, uh, each industry. Uh, clearly shows how the co consumers tend to perceive uh, agricultural goods as more highly substitutable than, than manufacturing goods. And this would provide, uh, of course, uh, producers with less incentives to diversify production, right? And for the cost of diversifying, this is maybe less uh, evident, uh, but I'm using the proximity measures as proposed by Hausmann and Hidalgo. Uh, they basically uh, propose a measure of economic uh, proximity between uh, any pair of goods. And by looking at the map of their proximity, you can clearly see how the average proximity between any two agricultural goods is much, is much uh, lower than the average proximity between manufacturing goods, meaning that the average cost of uh, jumping from the production of one agricultural good to a new one, uh, it's actually higher than doing so for manufacturing goods. Uh, four minutes. Yes, okay. So the quantification. So for the quantification of the mechanism, I'm proposing a more general version of the model where you have where I have uh, more than two economies. Uh, each can decide that, so there is no full specialization. Each can freely decide how much they're going to produce. Trade is, is costly now, so prices can be different across countries. Uh, I'm including growth in the intensive margin and I'm including non-homothetic preferences. Um, and what I obtain is, is, a, is an expression. I don't want you to focus on every variable here. That would be too silly, especially when I didn't introduce the model uh, in, in detail. But basically what I, what I want to reproduce, uh, uh, what I want to extract from this model is an expression on the change uh, of expenditure shares uh, in agricultural good for, every, for each country. And that's going to depend on the extensive margin growth, uh, intensive margin growth and the income effect. So here, I only want to highlight uh, the fact that there are many parameters playing a role here, uh, many um, preference parameters, and beta, the, the parameter driving the elasticity of substitution across, um, across uh, industries is also there. So that's key here. Um, so I can, I, I, uh, ideally, I, 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 would, I would drive, or I could drive 
uh, the values for these preference parameters from existing literature that have, have estimated these parameters. Uh, the problem is, for example, uh, I want to base myself in the, in, in the, in the, in the work by, by Herendorf and, and Rogerson and Valentini. Uh, but the problem is that most of, of, of these estimations are done with a service sector included. So I wonder what happens when you remove the service sector and, and, uh, and I, I want to use the parameters that uh, the value for the parameters that would come out of this kind of estimation. So here what I do is I replicate the uh, estimation done by uh, Herendorf and, and co-authors, right, where you have the service sector and they, they have the type of preference I was showing you before, which is the CES with the with the Stongiri flavor par parameter here. Um, and what I what I first did is just replicating the, their exercise, and then I removed the service sector. Uh, and to to my surprise, what I noticed is that the beta coefficient, so the elasticity of, of substitution across uh, industries, goes from uh, gross uh, complements to gross substitutes. Right. Uh, I did the same thing for Western Europe expenditure data. I got a similar result. So then I, 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 I thought, okay, I, I need to take this a little bit more seriously. And I uh, proposed uh, the, the, the following nested structure where I have a CES uh, between, uh, that first separates between goods and services, right? And the, the parameter, the relevant parameter there is epsilon. I'm going to call it epsilon. And then I'm going to call beta again the elasticity of substitution between manufacturing and agricultural goods uh, within the good co um, compound, right? Uh, so I'm estimating that, and that's the last column, the last two columns on the on the on the slide. And uh, uh, in this in these estimations, I'm not excluding the service sector. The service sector is there, but you still see how the elasticity of substitution across goods, so across between agricultural and manufacturing products. Uh, it's still above one. So that pushed me to use this value for beta and then the value, value for the other parameters I'm getting from, yeah, also for the table, but these are maybe less controversial. Uh, and then this is my, my last, last slide with the, with the results. Uh, what I see is by using uh, these values for the parameters that I can, uh, for example, here's the US, uh, in, 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 in this uh, roughly 60 year period of time, um, the amount of the, the share of expenditure in agricultural goods fell by 71%. And with the model, including the extensive margin of growth, I can almost, I can fully explain this. Uh, when I remove the extensive margin, uh, there is a gap that's left to fill, um, which is roughly 15% of the gap. I get uh, results that are similar or even uh, more important for, for other countries for which the fall is roughly of the similar magnitude, it's just the, the time periods are shorter. So yes, just to conclude, uh, the, in this paper, I present evidence documenting that uh, diversification rates or growth in the extensive margin are, is lower in the agricultural sector than in the manufacturing sector. And I find this fact very consistent and robust. Then I build a model to, to explain how this can explain uh, expenditure shifts and price movements um, against uh, the agricultural uh, sector. I'm quantifying the importance of the, my mechanism to uh, account for expenditure shifts of 15%. And interestingly, uh, I, I, I find that the mechanism proposed is, a, is, a, is, a, is an interesting way to link uh, technological differences from expenditure shifts Right, uh, I'm only aware of one paper by, by Matsuyama uh, last year uh, uh, doing the same thing. He does it in, 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 in a different way, but basically the, 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 the could be considered a puzzle here is why is it that uh, the very sector that it's lagging in, in productivity is also lagging in terms of expenditure shifts, right? So why is the consumers are preferring less the, the sector that is also lagging te technologically wise. So Matsuyama presents uh, his explanation in an econometric paper uh, last year. And this is uh, an alternative explanation that I'm providing. Uh, he beat me at that. Um, and yes, and I, I, I'm also providing a new explanation for falling in terms of trade for the South, which is not reliant only on, on, on a preference 
uh, explanation. So it's subject policy. Governments can do something about it. And the last thing I want to say is that I split uh, the whole sample of, of products uh, in, in agricultural and manufacturing goods, but this could the same thing could be happening across other partitions of the product space. So this could be interesting uh, target for future growth, for future work. And that's it. Great, thank you. Um, maybe sort of tying into your last point there about being subject to policy. I think Steve Redding had a, a question about the efficiency policy implications. Steve, are you there? Yeah, super interesting pa paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you. I was just sort of thinking from the facts at the beginning, it's very clear you have these differences in, in product diversification, but doesn't necessarily imply from that necessarily that there are any policy implications, right? In the model, there are policy implications because there are spillovers and there are externalities which generate, you know, potential inefficiencies and a potential role for policy. But I guess in principle, you could imagine trying to explain this with a competitive style model, right? Um, say an Ethan Quarter model, where you have an extensive margin, which is related to the T in a, the pressure scale parameter in a particular industry. And that might be growing at different rates in different countries in different sectors. And so the extensive margin of products might change, but in principle, that in principle could be all efficient. I mean, I think your model has got many interesting elements, which I think are probably true in reality. And I really liked how the terms of trade varies with the number of varieties in each sector and so on. But I was just kind of curious for your sort of thoughts on that, that, just in principle from the facts alone, it doesn't necessarily imply that there are spillovers. It's, it's a plausible interpretation, but you, you could think of other ones. Yes, so yes, I, I agree with that. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more on policy intervention, not to, not to fix uh, externalities or, 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 or things of the sort, uh, but most on growth promotion, right? Governments normally want to uh, promote growth, uh, and even when there are no I guess externalities involved, um, and that's kind of what, what I was trying to convey. Yeah. Thanks. And going back a little ways, Joe, did you still have a question you wanted to put in there? I was just uh, asking about sort of can we distinguish for the empirics? You know, can we distinguish growth? In the fine, I mean, I guess you, you discussed it a bit, but to what extent are classifications added um, over time? Is it is that endogenous? So I'm kind of thinking how how can you distinguish growth in the fineness of the categories, but but also just the addition of new uh, classification categories, product categories um, yes. from actual diversification? Yes. So that's that's of course tricky. And that's uh, yeah an unavoidable challenge, I would say. Uh, what, what I try to do to, to try to minimize uh, noise coming from, from, from this angle is just keeping uh, frozen categories, right? So just taking the categories existing at the, at the beginning of periods, categories uh, existing at the end of periods and see how the, the dots are filled, uh, and the, the, the beans are filled uh, in, uh, using this. Uh, but yeah, of course, it's. Yeah, I, I think this is an unavoid, unavoidable limitation when working with the extensive margin. Yes. So I guess it would seem like if you use the beginning of the cat, if you use the beginning of the time series category categories, the ones that existed at the beginning, yes, and kept those constant, and you still got the same patterns. That would certainly alleviate kind of my. Yes, that's that's what I do. Yes, that, I, I have that. Yes. Um, not just at the beginning of each, like. So you mean at the beginning of the entire sample? Yes. Okay. All right. That's neat. Guzman, can I just ask you this? Maybe a clarification, but I don't quite understand. So if you're holding the categories constant, then where are the new? What's new? Is this about what is actually traded or consumed? Yeah, so for, filling for, in the for, categories, or yes, for so categories are constructed at the world level, right? So they're uh, and, and and then countries, different countries are filling different beans at different moments in time. So, so it, it's perfectly possible that uh, countries just occupy in, an increasing number of beans over time. But I do the three exercises. I, I, do, it, I do them with a fixed amount of beans uh, with, the, with the initial beans, with the final beans, and also with the just changing beans over time. Got it, thanks. 
Um, I, I had a question coming back to the policy thing. You know, these are not the models I know the best, so this may be a completely off base question, but is there another sort of policy implication through the terms of trade channel? So is this either kind of a, a motive for using other trade policy to do terms of trade manipulation in order to sort of spur extensive margin growth in your country or, or am I thinking through that wrong? Mm. So uh, the, the, the only policy implication I can find is that it's promoting diversification. It's maybe more important than previously thought. So because it basically I'm, I'm saying that this has an effect on terms of trade. Uh, and before I, I, I the, the main, I, I think by the literature, the, the main reason to diversify production is just maybe to reach newer markets and decrease um, risks coming from being too specialized, volatility, for example. Uh, but but nothing, I, I, I'm not aware of any paper that have shown that um, this can affect your terms of trade. Julieta? Hi, I was man, very interesting paper. Um, so one question that I had is, why did you favor a notion of, of um, diversification that counts the categories versus you know, measures the spread in the, in the expenditure shares across these goods? In the sense that I could produce, kind of nominally produce a bunch of things, but my, my production base can be very concentrated in the sense that out of all the, um, the expenditure that I, that I have, it, that expenditure is concentrated in a particular category. Um, yeah. or I could have it completely spread. And, and I was curious whether you explore the notion and whether the results change when you, when you think of that alternative measure of, of, of diversification. Yes. So I think, I think that's a very valid point. Uh, but the, the, I, I think the approach I presented today is the only one that, or the only one I could think of that wouldn't introduce any intensive margin action. Right. If 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 I were to include the, the, the weights for for these for these classic codes, uh, then intensive margin growth would be like creating noise there. But so but I'm not sure if it is creating noise. I think it's a question of what what is more important if you want to think about uh, diversification. Is the fact that I produce a little bit of everything, or is it just the fact that I produce more stuff? And perhaps yes. I just concentrate everything in one of those goods. Yes. So yes. So I I, I think it's it's a it's a it's a yeah it's a valid concern. I I, I could try to yeah squeeze it in yes. To see. Awesome. So, sorry guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to cut things off there. Yeah. Um, maybe to be continued in the chat or or offline. Um, thank you everybody for a great session and and good questions and discussion. And I think I'm gonna hand things back to Doug now to wrap everything up. Um, okay, thanks so much. <clears throat> thanks a lot, Meredith, for picking up the chair. And I think there's not much to say in closing out the day, except I hope we'll see you all tomorrow. We have another day of great programming. And um, the, the STEG workshops continue beyond. I don't have the dates in front of me right now, but I'll look forward to seeing you all tomorrow at 9 Eastern, 2 UK, 3 Continental Europe, and wherever the place may be for you. So thanks very much. And, and a special thanks also to Mandy Chan from CEPR, who's been handling the admin side today. So thanks a lot, Mandy, for making everything run so smoothly. So thanks to all the presenters. Thanks to, thanks to Cheers and keeping us, keeping us all on time. And see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks.